written impact statements on behalf of our charge victims. I know the court has those and has uh, very likely reviewed those already. Um, so I don't want to spend a lot of time with my thoughts and impressions right now because I think what's really um, most important for is for this court to hear from these families. And the reason I say that is, you know, Judge, that at trial um, we asked some cursory questions about the injuries that were received and the impact that these crimes had on the individuals that were directly involved, but we didn't spend a lot of time on that. And I think um, this court is really going to be astounded to hear the level of injury that many of these uh, people suffered, many children suffered the impact, the life-changing impact it's had on them. So this will be different and new information than what we presented at trial. And I think it's very relevant and important for your honor to consider um, when you're uh, uh, deciding on a fair and appropriate sentence and knowing the gravity of the crime, the seriousness of the situation and the impact that it had on the community to hear from these families directly as to what they went through. And again, um, this was touched on at trial as far as the physical injury versus the emotional injury and the trauma that has been suffered. So um, I think um, that will be important as well for this court to appreciate uh, this defendant's conduct. We're past the guilty uh, finding. He's been convicted. Now it's time to talk about what exactly his conduct did to our community and to these families. So um, these uh, speakers are grouped, not necessarily within um, the groups as they march down the street, but there is some logic to, um, so we're not gonna bounce all over the place is what I'm trying to say. We'll, we'll try and uh, clump them together uh, to make the most uh, sense to the court and um, with the court's permission. We have a set lineup, of course. Uh, we may need to um, be a little bit fluid depending on somebody's uh, emotional state or um, desire to speak when it's their appointed turn. There are some individuals that have said they're going to try and read their statement to the court, but they may not be able to get through it, in which case I believe Jen Dunn will um, step in and, and read the remainder of the statement for them. Thank you. Um, would you please confirm on the record that the state has complied with victim rights? Yes. We will confirm that, Your Honor. Thank you. And then please give the court a heads up when a juvenile is next yes. so that uh, the cameras can take the appropriate steps as well. Yes, absolutely. And for the record, we did provide a list to the uh, cameramen from Court TV or uh, individuals from Court TV, and uh, we're trying to assist them in that regard as well. We want to thank them again um, for their uh high degree of concern for obeying uh, the court's order and their respect and uh, uh, intention to strictly adhere to uh, maintaining the privacy rights of these victims. So they've been uh, absolutely very professional in that regard, Your Honor. Thank you. And then just lastly, because I would like to keep track and obviously I will honor however they want to introduce themselves, but if you could also tell me which victim they relate to, if it's not self-evident, sure, that would be great as well, and I'm gonna keep a list. Okay, right, thank go you. Go ahead. All right then, I believe our first speaker would be Lori Loken. And if it pleases, is this on? How's the volume? <laughs> There we go. If it pleases the court, Your Honor, one of my staff will actually go let Court TV know when a minor is coming next. Thank you, I appreciate that. All right. And uh, are you going to say the victim that you relate to, or I can tell the court this is for victim UU? Thank you. Good morning, ma'am. Thank you for being here. Good morning. I'm addressing the court. Is the microphone on? Yeah, it is. Okay. I'm addressing the court, but I also want to direct my comments to Daryl Brooks, Jr. My name is Lori Locken. I was walking with the Catholic community of Waukesha, my church family. We were celebrating the joy of the season in preparation for the birth of Jesus 
when you made your decision to drive through the parade route. It truly amazes me that you deny your accountability for the damage and hurt that you have willfully caused. In the years ahead, I urge you to carefully consider the sorrow and grief of the Waukesha community and the world at large. Ponder the loss of lives within our families, the physical and emotional injuries that may never heal, and the sense of personal safety that you robbed from us. As for me, you never gave me a chance. I turned around and it was only seconds before you hit me square on. I clearly remember feeling the impact. The searing pain of that blow is as clear to me today as it was a year ago. Since then, I'm healing as best as I can from the physical injuries, but you took away my peace and my trust something that I will never regain. My prayer for you is that you will find your salvation in the midst of this evil. I hope that you will repent for the heartache you have caused so many. I too pray that your own personal wounds that you have sustained through your life, which has created so many demons in you, will be healed through this action. Thank you. Thank the court for this opportunity. Uh, I am Bill Mitchell, formerly known as Victim ZZ. To you, Mr. Brooks, I'm charged 52. Um, on November 21st, uh, 2021, I was marching with the Catholic community of Waukesha and the Waukesha Christmas Parade. I was walking in the back and I noticed our banner was flying up because of the wind. So I went up the hole down the middle with, uh, uh, so people could read it. I was joined by a priest uh, who helped hold it down. Uh, we walked almost the entire joyful parade route. When uh, something caught my attention, I turned around and saw a headlight. Uh, and then I was hit. I didn't see the driver and I didn't see the type of vehicle. I flew over the hood and ended up on the ground with eight broken ribs, bruised lung, fractured hand, finger, and my face was slashed open in several places, requiring stitches. Strangers and friends came to my aid as I lay bleeding in the street. I spent three nights in an ICU. Recovery was slow. My hand still has painful cramps that freeze in my fingers. But I know I was lucky. Others had a lot worse injuries and six died. The impact on my family was great. My wife was home recuperating from surgery when she received the call. I was hurt badly and on the way to a hospital trauma center. Not able to drive yet, she had to wait for my son and his fiance to pick her up and drive her to Oconomowoc. And after I was released, she had to do a 180 from patient to be my nurse and help me in even the most basic tasks. The stress had slowed her recovery. The continuing pain was a major factor on me giving up a part-time job I enjoyed. We had to rely on family and friends for transportation to doctors for follow-up care for months. Neighbors pitched in to do my yard work and snow removal. Youth from the neighborhood decorated the inside of our house for Christmas. This crime had a ripple effect throughout the community. I do want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for your diligence and sacrifice to be here. I tell people I was blessed because I didn't see the carnage that night. I just saw people helping me. But the jury and all of you had to watch the entire awful scene on videos and hear detailed reports of what happened. I'm sure that's going to stay with all of you. I wanted to thank the judge for her patience and knowledge, the police, Detective Casey, for their thorough investigation and quick arrest, the prosecution for presenting such a strong case. A special thank you to Jen Dunn, Carrie, and the entire victim's assistance team that informed, comforted, and listened to the many people impacted by this tragic event. Finally, I can't bring myself to thank the defendant but the response to the evil act he did shined a spotlight on how strong, supportive, and loving community we live in. Many people and organizations stepped up to help me. Family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, first responders, Aurora, doctors, nurses, my church family, the Catholic Community of Waukesha, Knights of Columbus, AOH, United for Waukesha Community Fund, Catholic Charities, and so many strangers offered support and prayers. The vast majority of people are good.
That said, then there is Mr. Brooks. He is a unique individual who can have a clear conscience after over, running over kids like speed bumps and killing six people. I would suggest someone without a conscience. He doesn't ask for forgiveness. He doesn't admit to do anything wrong. It is never his fault. When he slapped a woman, it was her fault because she made him mad. I believe if he made it home that night with the red SUV, he would have told his mom the damage wasn't his fault. He was in a hurry and people didn't get out of his way. Some crazy old fat gray hair guy body slammed his hood. I didn't watch all the trial, but the parts I saw, that I saw showed Mr. Brooks had a lack of empathy for his victims or remorse for his actions. The only regrets he seemed to have is that he was caught in the impact on his own life. Free, he would probably not drive through another parade, but chances are someone so self-centered as Mr. Brooks will hurt other people again. The only life he seems to value is his own. I don't believe that Mr. Brooks will think about me or any of his victims ever. The feeling is mutual. I really don't think much about him now, but when the prison door closes on this felon, I won't think about him again. I do hope Mr. Brooks will use the Bible for more than a courtroom prop. He may want to start with the basics that I know his family had taught him, thou shalt not kill. But then <coughs> you might want to read Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Your Honor, I hope you give him the time to read and study the Bible. Mr. Brooks did everything he could to try to make the trial a circus. It is not a circus. It's not even about Mr. Brooks. Today, the court will hear what the trial is about, the victims. And as former Victor ZZ, I would ask the court for a sentence that keeps the defendant, Darrell E. Brooks Jr., away from society forever. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Brooks, my name is Jason Peckloff, and I'm with the Catholic Community of Waukesha. I was one of the victims you hit with the SUV you were driving on November 21st. What you did to my Catholic community and to the city of Waukesha show that you had no regard for life. What makes it more disappointing that you have shown no remorse for what you have done. While you're sitting in prison, I want you to reflect what you have done. I want you to reflect that you nearly took my life. I almost lost the chance to see my wife and kids again. I may have never had the chance to love or hug them again. You intentionally harmed my community, whether it was physical or psychological. You stole our innocent that day. Before that tragedy you created, it was a beautiful day we all experienced and never thought an evil thing like this could ever happen at a parade. My friend, myself, and the Waukesha Catholic community were asking parishioners and their families to participate in this parade. Imagine the guilt we must all bear for the rest of our lives. Because of your actions, I was out of work for about six weeks. Then I had to go back part-time because of my sustained injuries. Because of your actions, the multiple lacerations you created leaked out of the bandages and onto my bed, comforter, and sheets. What an awful visual to have. Because of your actions, I could have lost my foot. Thank God my nurse friend was checking on me. Because of your actions, my wife cannot get the images out of her mind of what you have done. You have forever scarred her. Because of your actions, my wife had to hand over my children to our community friends to check on my lifeless body. Because of your actions, my children, four and six at the time, had to go with a grieving friend to find her own child that was in lockdown. It took a while for them to be reunited. Because of your actions, my children are scared to death when they had to cross the same street you drove down. They were bawling and begging me not to cross the street. Because of your actions, I need to reassure my children that this 
that it is safe at parades. Not sure they ever feel 100% safe. Because of your actions, not all people in our community are ready to go back to the parades. Again, you stole that innocent from them. Because of your actions, my children are scared of sirens. Because of your actions, they were scared of red SUVs every time they saw one. They cried and hid. Because of your actions, I walked into the entrance of my children's school and felt like a triage unit. I saw children on crutches and a walker. What an awful image to be burned into my memory. Because of your actions, I feel terrible. I could not help my community and the city by testifying during the trial. Your cowardly actions did this. Your actions forced my family to seek out therapy and resolve in their minds what happened. Your actions made a second guess what we did that day. What could we have done differently? During this trial, you show no remorse. It makes you look like a monster. During the trial, you show little regard and respect to the court. It makes you look disrespectful. During the trial, you treated multiple witnesses terribly. You were trying to twist the words of our pastor, who is a man of the cloth. You made a comment to a witness you injured that he was walking fine now. It makes you a callous jerk. Despite what you have done to my community, I forgive you. Forgiveness does not remove the need for justice. Justice must be served and you must go to prison. My prayer is that forgiveness will heal your wounds and the wounds for the city. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Margaret Petulis, victim BBB, count 54. I know I am blessed to be here today to present my statement to the court. Daryl Brooks's choices on November 21st, 2021, took a toll mentally, physically, and emotionally on me as well as affecting my family. I remember the moment someone yelled car and I turned to see a vehicle behind and to the right of me. My thought was, what is this vehicle doing here? After that moment, I have a void in my memory. My mind won't let me see what happened. I remember my thoughts. Oh my God, this can't be happening. Please, not my hip, not my leg. My next memory is laying, lying on the ground with a person from our group and a nurse talking to me and asking how I was. They worked on keeping me calm and from going into shock. I will always be grateful to them. Every night I would lay awake and replay the incident to see if I could get the memory back. Months of counseling and the passage of time have helped me be somewhat okay with not knowing what happened. One of my fears is that when I least expect the memory, at least expect it, the memory will return. After being impacted by the vehicle, I was laying on the ground with severe pain to my left leg. Emergency people stopped by and one questioned whether I had been shot and all I could think of is why would I have been shot? I was eventually lifted into a police SUV and taken to Waukesha Memorial Hospital. I was examined and was released after being diagnosed with a broken bone in my left foot. I was instructed to wear the boot provided by the hospital, sit in a recliner, keep my leg elevated, and not put any weight on my left foot. I was instructed to follow up with an orthopedic doctor the following week. I went home and found it very hard to get from the car into the house. I couldn't figure out how to walk without putting my left foot down on the ground. My stomach was nauseous from the pain medicine. My husband and daughter assisted me into the house and sat me in a chair. I immediately passed out, and when I came to, my husband and daughter were concerned that I had had a stroke. They called 911, and I was transferred to Aurora Trauma Center. I was examined head to toe and again released with a diagnosis of a broken bone in my left foot. 
We live in a tri-level, and I was able to get to the lower level where there is a bedroom, a bathroom, and a family room. For the next six weeks, I would sit in the recliner with my left leg elevated and ice packs applied. I also slept with a wedge that kept my leg elevated while I was sleeping. After experiencing more pain in my left leg, I was sent for an ultrasound, and the ultrasound found a hematoma on the inside of my left leg. Standing up was extremely painful even without putting pressure on my left foot. It would take me a couple of times of standing and then sitting back down on the side of the bed until I could bring myself to hop on my right leg using a walker for balance to get to the bathroom or to the recliner. My husband had to help me in and out of bed due to the extreme pain in my lower left leg. I couldn't dress or undress myself, take a shower, go to doctor's appointments or to mass without his help. Every day he had to apply gauze wrap and an ace bandage to my left leg to cover the blisters so that they, as they would burst, they were covered. He then applied the boot sock and a boot. Every day for s several weeks he had to prepare all meals and bring them down on a tray to me. We were fortunate that he was working from home during this time. I had orthopedic appointments and three rounds of physical therapy. I am still going through physical therapy. After the bone healed in my foot, I was still experiencing pain in my ankle. The pain limited me. I had trouble walking normally, could not walk any great distance. Going up and down the stairs was best sitting on the stairs and going down that way. As time went on, I was frustrated that I could not perform the simple act of walking down the stairs. Before going to the third physical therapist, fr frustration set in as I thought I would always have pain and not be able to do all the things I enjoyed, such as pickleball, stand-up paddleboarding, kayaking, walking miles, and traveling. My third round of physical therapy found that the whole left side of my body was twisted from the impact of the vehicle. After 10 and a half months and three rounds of physical therapy, I am now 95% back to normal. All the months of suffering and thinking no one would be able to figure out what was wrong, I was worried that the pain would remind me forever the choices Daryl Brooks made on November 21st, 2021. I wanted my life back. During this time of feeling, if a healing, I felt isolated and frustrated that the Advent and the Christmas season were happening and I was unable to decorate, shop, or participate as I usually would during the holidays. Emotionally, since being struck by the vehicle driven by Daryl Brooks, I have felt like a victim. Every day I was reminded that I was limited by physical pain and loss of self. The world went on, but I was stuck, not able to move forward. Today, I am taking the final step forward in my journey of coming out the other side of this incident. Life is starting to look like it was before November 21st, 2021. I know I am not the same person that I was before this trauma, but now I have an enhanced appreciation for life and a stronger sense of spirituality. I am grateful to have a supportive family, supportive friends, and my Catholic community of Waukesha who have all walked this road with me. Forgiveness is a choice. I know that I can forgive you, Daryl Brooks, without forgetting the trauma you caused, without you apologizing and acknowledging your actions. This may take some time for me to accomplish, but after today, I will not let your actions take over my life. I will move on. Regarding sentencing, Your Honor, I would like to request that due to Daryl Brooks's total lack of concern for human life on November 21st, 2021, that for each count that the jury returned a guilty verdict, Daryl Brooks received the maximum sentence for each of those counts. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Jeff Rogers. Um, my children were victims U and V. I'm a father of four, three of which were marching with me in the parade last November. Two of my children were struck and injured. I also serve as the president of the Waukesha Blazers baseball and fast pitch organization and was a couple, couple months into that job at the time of the parade. I've debated whether or not to read a statement for this sentencing. At the end of the day, I felt it necessary to have my voice heard for my sake, for my family's sake, and for the Waukesha Blazers' sake, and for all the other victims. I'm here today with families that I love, and I'm so sorry that this happened. 
First of all, this event was completely avoidable, and from my perspective, there has been zero remorse, sympathy, or acknowledgement of the victims by the defendant. All he had to do was stop the vehicle when he saw the crowd, and none of these lives would have been changed forever. For this reason alone, he needs to be locked up for the rest of his life. But enough about him. This is about the impact on, of the event on me, my family, and our Blazers organization. I'd like to speak as a father, first of all. The impact this has had on my family and I has been immense. This last year has been full of confusion, irritation, anxiety, and depression. We haven't been able to live a normal life. The trial has been dragged out and literally we were pulled back through to relive everything, all because this person wouldn't admit it like a man and take what was coming to him. My kids are some of the strongest people I know and they have proven that through the faith in God they've displayed throughout. However, the impact this has had on them literally makes me sick. No more parades, that joy is gone. This is something that will never leave them. I'm still learning things today as well about what they heard and saw that day. I pray every night that God continues to strengthen them to push through and know that he is in control. That night when we got home, I'll never forget Caden looking at me with glassy eyes. He looked up at me and said, I'm really glad Riley is okay, and started to cry. When my wife Stacy sat on the chair next to me that night, it felt different. She hugged me longer than normal and a lot more firm than normal and said, thanks for keeping our kids safe. Everyone saw on the videos that were shown, we're literally inches away from losing three out of our four, four children, and myself included. I thank God each day that he spared us and provided the adrenaline, courage, and strength to get my kids out of the way, gather all the kids we could, and pray together. My wife was going to come with us that night along with our toddler son. I play things in my head over and over, imagining what could have been if she would have come. Where would she have been standing when that SUV barreled through? I have flashbacks most days to Maya's jacket slipping through my hand. If I wouldn't have grabbed it the second time, I know what the outcome would have been. Riley still has trouble sleeping with some nights getting out of bed six, seven, eight, nine times because she heard a noise or doesn't feel safe. A few days ago, I was one-on-one -on -one in the car with her and I finally apologized for not finding her right away. Thank God our friend found her and kept her safe, but as her dad, I've lived with the fact that I couldn't find all my kids that night after it happened. I went way too long not knowing where my kids were, with panic overwhelming me. As a father, I can confidently say that this incident had a year-long impossible impact on me and our family. Are we managing? Yes, of course, as God is in control. Now to speak as the Blazers president. This was a happy gathering and almost the kickoff of my presidency with the Blazers since I was only a couple of months in. We were getting to know each other, welcoming a new coach, our new board members, and overall just ready to advertise our Blazers program. Looking back at the pictures from prior to the tragedy, we were so happy. So much love and camaraderie. We were ready for an awesome season. I spoke just prior about my perspective during the event as a father of three kids, but as the president of our organization, the weight of the moment to find an account for everyone felt like it was on my shoulders. We had nearly 35 people there. I knew I had lots of help, and for that I can't thank the other parents and coaches enough. The moment was a blur, and gathering and putting kids up in the truck was the priority. From there, the kids I could find huddled with me in the theater and we said a prayer for those injured and being attended to. I knew that the next few days were going to be intense, but I never fully grasped how crazy the following days, weeks, and months would be. The amount of turmoil and struggle for our Blazers organization was literally insurmountable. From the moment of the incident, the amount of media and law enforcement interaction was exhausting and unending. Media showing up at my door asking for individual participants' status, unbeknownst to them that two of my children were hurt. There was nonstop email flow, phone calls, planning, coordinating, and filtering through things. It was endless work. This job went from something I truly loved from my biggest passion in life to something I cried about for months. I went from giving speeches on Facebook Live about how cool our new indoor facility was to speaking at Jackson's funeral. From there, the community really pulled together. The amount of love and compassion that came our way was also unending. It was honestly overwhelming. For that, we cannot thank this community enough. Finally, I wanted to briefly touch on the true impact this has had on me. My faith was challenged over the past year, but I can confidently say it's stronger than ever. The hardest part about the whole incident was not knowing where my kids were, not having answers for what just happened, not knowing if more danger was coming. I knew I had Maya next to me, but when I went back and forth screaming for Caden and Riley, that horror plagues me every day. I go back to those moments quite often, and when I watch the videos during the trial, it brought back all those feelings. Pure and utter terror, that's what it was and that's the impact it still has today. Finally, in closing, I'm a man of faith and wanted to share two Bible passages which have pushed me through. 
First of all, my confirmation passage, Joshua 1, 9, it reads, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And secondly, I met with my pastor prior to testifying, and he provided me with an excellent part of scripture, Philippians 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understandings, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you for listening, and may God strengthen us all. Thank you, sir. My name is Jessica Gonzalez, and this is my husband, Juan Gonzalez Lopez. We represent the Blazers organization, as well as many others, and you could even argue the state of Wisconsin. Last night, as I thought about my statement, my son scooched over on the, co over on the couch and snuggled into me. He laid with his head on my lap, and I stroked his hair. We stayed like that until it was time for bed. He knows we're here today, and it was as if he knew we needed a little extra love last night. Moments like these should be pure with love and affection, but since November 21st, they are mixed with flashes and images of what could have been. Mama, I'm here. I was on the other side. This is one of the memories and words that I'll never forget and hear dozens of times a day without warning. The relief I felt hearing those words on November 21st was devastating, but I found my son unharmed. That should be the end of the story, right? We're fine, right? Physically, yes, but fine is a word we use when people ask us if we're okay, but we're not. It was only a short time before we had readied for the parade, got our hot cocoa, and took pictures to snap a shot of the fun about to be had. Before the parade, I left him with his teammate and new friend Jackson at the Blazers drop-off spot and walked my daughter to her dance team location. With my mother-in-law visiting from Mexico, she was excited for her first Christmas parade. Stationed at the corner of the Clark Hotel with friends, my daughter's dance group waved with smiles as they passed us. She was headed to the library where I would pick her up. The Dancing Grannies, one of our favorite groups, performed flawlessly as they passed us. My son's baseball group was after the extreme dancers who were within with sight. Then the gasps and screams came from everywhere and the red SUV sped past us. I yelled stop and put my hands out like I had the power to make it happen. I felt like I was punched in the stomach when I realized the SUV came from the direction of my son's group. Panicked and lightheaded and knowing my daughter was safe, I ran to find my son. Running through the streets, my legs felt like they had a life of their own. I found Jackson first. I saw his little body in his blazer's jersey, his eyes looking up, looking nowhere. I knew he was hurt badly. Seeing Jackson on the ground, I began looking for my son amongst, amongst the rest of the bodies. I screamed hysterically, searching frantically. What ifs filled my head. I heard mom from so many directions, but it wasn't him. Finally, it was. I turned to see him with other blazers who were in the team truck. He called out to me, Mama, I'm here. I was on the other side. 
Yes, I found my son unharmed. But after, the chaos continued. We ran. I covered his eyes as we rushed back to our group. I called my husband to tell him something terrible had happened, but had no words to explain. Headed for the library, we were told there was an active shooter. We ran again. I covered my son's head with my arms so bullets would hit me first. He cried. I tried to assure him and myself that things like this don't happen. At the library, I ran up the stairs and shouted for my daughter, who was huddled with a friend and her daughter. Yes, I found my children unharmed. But after, the pain and terror continued. After the parade, we discovered people had died and that several people in my son's group were hit, including his coach and teammate. We learned that my son's teammate was in critical condition, but I already knew this. I still see his eyes without closing mine. What does it feel like to attend a funeral of a child your age? I hate that my kids know. I hate that I didn't get a chance to cheer on my son and Jackson during the baseball season last year. I hate that my son said it was weird having one less teammate. For more than a week, it was late nights to avoid sleep and our family of four piled into one bed. There was no question this was a traumatic experience. Counselors were available. My son didn't want to talk about it. And today still doesn't. I tried to return to work. I tried to return to teaching. I couldn't make it through a day without feeling hypervigilant, startling at every noise, having a panic attack from the sound of a door, shout, thud, gasp, anything and everything. After the parade, I couldn't make it through a day. My joy disappeared. I felt guilty. I had no right to feel joy since my son and daughter were alive and others were not. I was open about questions my kids had, but I cried and screamed in agony when they weren't around. I overreacted, shouting and pulling my kids near in the parking lots and streets or any time I saw a car come within a quarter mile away, convinced they all had ill intentions. PTSD throws all the punches. I left my career to work intensively on healing in a program for PTSD. I have only just returned to the workplace, only just a month ago. Something quieter, something with less action. Because after almost one year, some days still feel like November 21st was yesterday. Intrusive memories, hypervigilance, nightmares, anxiety, panic attacks, depression, anger, guilt, shame. These are all things I and others live with daily because Daryl Brooks drove through our joy and turned it to terror. When he suggested he could have hit more, he was wrong. He hit everyone. The toll this event has taken on everyone, physically hurt or not, is tremendous. And it sickens me to know that there are so many others with a similar story as ours. I know some today may offer forgiveness, but for me, forgiveness is for accidents for mistakes or poor choices that the offender expresses remorse for their actions. Daryl Brooks offers no remorse, but he did search for sympathy for himself. I cannot offer forgiveness. I will not. Daryl Brooks should be held accountable for every second of pain and trauma he inflicted on all of us that day including the many years inflicted already 
on Miss Patterson. Free, he is and always will be a danger to society. With that, Your Honor, I ask that the full sentence is issued and he spends the rest of his days in prison without the chance of parole. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I'm Lindsay Conkle, and my family walked with the Waukesha Blazers. November 21st, 2021, my family walked in the Waukesha Christmas Parade. My boys were dressed proudly in their baseball jerseys, <clears throat> streets lined with smiling faces. The crowd was happy and excited. In a split second, excited cheers turned into sounds of screaming and horror. A trail of bloody bodies were left laying in the road. My family was not physically injured that day. We somehow dodged the path of the car by inches. Our mental and emotional injuries were severe and they remain a struggle for us every day. We have the image and the sound plow of a SUV plowing through people burned into our minds for the rest of our lives. My children were separated and I ran through a trail of bloody bodies that were left laying in the road. I will not forget how many people I saw, some seizing in an intersection, some unconscious and some not. My children cried themselves to sleep for weeks after and still do. They still wake up with nightmares, as do I. They could not walk in a parking lot without clinging to me, shaking and terrified that a car would try to run them down. We suffer from major panic attacks and PTSD, all from a day that was supposed to be happy and exciting. As parents, we have to try to help cope with, with our children while we do not know how to cope ourselves. My children, my family, and I, and every person that we know will never be the same after that day. There were many people that were fortunate, fortunate enough to walk away unharmed. However, Jackson Sparks was not one of those people. A child, eight-year-old, walking next to his big brother with his whole life ahead of him. The next time my children wore their baseball jerseys was to a funeral. A funeral for an eight-year-old boy their friend, their teammate, that they have spent many days playing and making memories at while at their brother's baseball games. His family and friends will never see his smiling face light up a room, and his team will never be able to celebrate a win with him on the baseball field ever again. Every moment of Jackson's life that was ahead of him was ripped away by Daryl Brooks. You, Daryl Brooks, you hid in a children's playhouse and ditched your hoodie in a sandal. That playhouse happened to be my children's, at the house we just moved out of a couple of months prior. That playhouse was built for them, built for my sons, and you hid there after you left their friend and teammate lifeless in a road along with many others. You didn't just get lost in a parade route, you disregarded police and the safety of hundreds and you disregarded life. You very selfishly ripped away the joy from the families who were there just to bring joy to others. There are many holes left in our community, but our community has grown stronger and we all have each other. You, however, will have no one. You will have no one in a cell where you belong for the rest of your life. Thank you, Judge Doro, and we ask that please, he never see the light of day again. Thank you. My name is Sherry Sparks. I am Jackson and Tucker's mom. I stand here today with my son Tucker and my husband Aaron. I'm here today to represent my family, but mostly for my boys, who were both struck down by the red SUV on November 21st. I want to give a voice to our son Jackson Sparks. Our family is forever changed. We are hurt, angry, traumatized, and broken. November 21st was a day that was supposed to be fun and filled with laughter and smiles. Instead, it became a nightmare full of fear, screams, and tears. I put the first one up. Okay, 
My boys were walking in the Waukesha Christmas Parade with their baseball teammates, friends, and coaches. It was a chilly and windy day that day, so we all layered up and prepared to kickstart our holiday season. We met up with our Blazers group, decorated the truck, prepared the buckets of candy and flyers for the boys, took some group photos, and then I left to go find my seat near the end of the parade route and wait for our group while enjoying the parade. I had no idea then the nightmare that was coming my way. Nor did I know that it would be the last time I would hear Jackson's voice and see his smile. I wish I would have known then that the hug he gave me before I went to sit down was the last hug I would ever get from him. I would have held on to him a lot longer. <laughs> After the red SUV flew past us, it was pure chaos. I will never ever forget the horrible sound of the car hitting bodies and the thud of bodies landing on the ground. I immediately grabbed my favorite plaid blanket ran up the street to find my boys. What I found shook my world. I saw Jackson first in the arms of a police officer. He was running him to get a medical attention. My husband was right behind them and told me that Tucker had been struck also. Pointed me back to the direction where Tucker was. Can you do the second photo, please? That's Tucker underneath my blanket there, the plaid blanket. My world came crashing down at that moment. I wanted to scream, I wanted to throw up and cry. Adrenaline kicked in and I went to find my boy. I spotted Jackson's baseball hat lying in the road first, then Tucker's hat, then I found Jackson's shoe, which kind of led me to Tucker. I finally spotted him. He was one of the many bodies lying in the road, covered in blankets. I recognized the shoes on his feet. That's how I found him. They're sticking out from under the blanket. I stayed at Tucker's side as he lay in the road waiting for an ambulance to come back for him. He was semi-conscious, but we couldn't move him without a backboard due to his head being injured. They had run out of backboards. Luckily, a nearby shop owner slash hero dragged a door out of her shop to roll him onto so we could get him out of the cold and get him warm. An hour laying out in the cold road where he was thrown from impact. You can go to the next photo, please. This is what we were facing next. Both boys had traumatic head and brain injuries. They both ended up in the ICU at Children's Hospital. Their rooms just a few doors down from one another. The next day, Tucker asked us about Jackson, if he was okay or was he worse than himself. Do you have any idea how gut-wrenching it is to have to explain your 12-year-old son that his little brother isn't going to make it? His injuries are too extensive for his little body to come back from, and that he won't be coming home with us ever again. Leaving him at the hospital was brutal. To see the confusion, frustration, and hurt on his face when he's standing over his little brother in his hospital room taken in all the machines he was hooked up to. It... Tucker remembers everything up until the moment he was hit. He had actually turned around and saw the SUV coming towards them. He said Jackson was right next to him. He said he saw a few people get hit, and then he tried to run out of harm's way. He didn't make it. Being the protective big brother, Tucker blamed himself. He felt he should have tried to grab Jackson or done more to protect his little brother. It broke my heart to hear him saying these things. Tucker's physical injuries were also severe. He still struggles with memory issues and brain processing speed. The mental and emotional damage is severe. Survivor's guilt, PTSD, anxiety, he still gets headaches. His little brother was taken from him. He's suddenly an only child now. He misses his little brother and his playmate. Jackson brought out the silly in him, and life will never be the same without him. You can go to the next photo. Every holiday, special event, family function, vacation, there will always be an empty chair or space where Jackson should be. Jackson's absence is very prominent. Every day we face that vacancy, and it triggers sadness and trauma. 
Jackson's life was taken from him and taken from us. Life isn't the same without him and it never will be. This morning, I should have spent the morning making him breakfast, taking him to school, hearing about his day later. Instead, I'm standing here in this courtroom asking for justice for my boys. We came so close to losing both of them that day. I miss Jackson every second of every single day. I feel gutted and broken. It hurts to breathe sometimes. It hurts to live without him here. My mama's soul aches for him. I am emotionally and mentally exhausted. The pain I carry with me every day feels so heavy. Yet I have to push forward, still be there to help Tucker heal and move forward with find our new normal. Can you go to the next photo, please? As a family of faith, we know this man will face God's judgment someday for his actions. Until then, we feel it is this court's duty and responsibility to all the victims to sentence this man to the maximum penalty allowed under Wisconsin law for each and every guilty charge. We feel this man does not deserve to see freedom in our lifetime, nor our son Tucker's lifetime. We have learned throughout this trial that this man is incapable of empathy or remorse. He has shown no sympathy nor apology for all, the, all of the pain, suffering, and loss of life he has caused to so many. This man not only took Jackson away from our family, he violently ripped Jackson out of our lives. Jackson was only eight years old, eight. He only had eight years here with us. He was robbed of everything. He will never get to hit a home run, catch frogs with his brother again, meet his wrestling hero, Braun Strowman. He won't ask a girl to prom. He won't go to college, get married, or have children of his own. Jackson will never be able to do any of these things. These milestones will never happen. He was a bright light in our lives. He was very shy to most people, but those close to him, to his family, he was a big ball of energy. He was charismatic and full of light and life. His life was cut out way too short. Jackson and the other victims deserve justice. We deserve closure in order to heal and find our new normal. We hope to achieve that today. Thank you. And thank you, prosecution, Judge Doro, very much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Request a break and bring in the second group. Yes, the court's going to step off as well while you do that. We'll Thank take a, about a 10 minute break. Thank you.
All right, we are back on the record. The state may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, for group two, I believe, Kelly, are you going to call? life changed forever. My brother and I were headed to parade. We've been scared of parades not letting us feel safe and comfortable or even being able to run out into the road to fetch candy. For example, when I went to the Arrowhead Parade, all my friends were asking me why I didn't want to go out into the road to get candy and I said because of the walkie shop parade. And I was mad because if the parade incident did not happen, I'd be able to go onto the road to enjoy something as simple as a parade. When I got to the parade with my friends, I constantly remember to not go onto the road to be better safe than sorry. It is the last thing I want to happen again. How could you do this? Think of your kids. Would you do this to them? I'm just a child with a lifetime left to live. I'm also here from a younger brother, victim KKK. When he is hit by the front of the car, he was traumatized for it. I feel his fear. I feel his pain because when I was hit, I broke down into tears too. On the way to the hospital, we had to lay our head down on the floor because we heard there was a shooter. My fingers, my whole body was paralyzed in fear and fright. When we made it to the hospital, I was terrified because I thought I broke my fingers. And when they asked me what happened, I was too busy crying that I couldn't speak. I still think about this event to this day. A day after the parade, I couldn't even go to school because of what he did. All my friends were worried about me, texting me, asking if I was even alive. Sometimes I even think of all the others that were hit and how they were in the hospital for longer than me and how their parents were probably praying that their kids would be okay and that this would be a once in a lifetime happening. I think this should have never happened to us. The day I went back to school, everyone was asking me a million questions every time I was alone. Everyone was babying me, acting like, I was, acting like one of my family members was killed. What makes it worse is that almost a year ago, my dog died, and I have lived with it my whole life, so I was extra sad and upset. At that moment, I realized that our family had to find justice against the man who hit too many people and caused a nightmare on November 21st, 2021. I ask for this pain to never be caused again. Thank you. And I've been asked to read a statement by victim KKK. <clears throat> when I got hit by the car that day, it hurt a lot. I got hit on my right leg, and it still kind of hurts now and then. That hit changed my life, and it still scares me sometimes when I think about it. I also feel bad for the families who lost someone and everyone who died and was in the parade. And then he drew a picture of a SUV, and it says, car that hit me, and there's a little figure and candy bucket and bottle and me. So they handed that to me on behalf of victim KKK. <clears throat> Your Honor, we need to take a break for a second, please. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. it's important. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. We'll do that.
seated. Madam Clerk, do you have the um, All right, thank you. At a, shortly before 10 a.m., uh, there was an abrupt stop to the proceedings uh, when I was asked by uh, the sheriff to meet with him, and I was advised at that time that their communication center had received a threat to the courthouse. As everyone is well aware, it's now 11.14 a.m. The sheriff has assured me that this building is quite safe um, very secure were his words, and that he has taken all reasonable measures to secure the courthouse. At this time, I am not going to stop these proceedings. We will continue, um, and I will rely on the Sheriff's Department and law enforcement personnel to advise if anything changes. I apologize for the abrupt disruption previously, um, but I'm confident that we can go forward at this time. I know when we took that break, right before that, Jen Dunn was, uh, had been reading a statement from one of the juvenile victims, and there was a picture that was referenced. I would like to make a request for that picture to be made part of the record. Thank you, Judge. We had anticipated that as well. We're prepared to display that at this time on the monitor. And then will that be filed? Uh, yes, I can file that. All right, go ahead. So again, this is the uh, note and uh, drawing by victim KKK. Can you tell me the age of KKK? Eight years old. Thank you very much. Were you <laughs> completed with that statement, Ms. Dunn? I am completed with victim KKK's statement, and you can now see the drawing that was made by that victim on the bottom of his statement. Thank you very much. Next, I do have the statement of the mother of victim KKK and LLL to read for the court. I am not sure how or where to begin to try and put into words how November 21st of 2021 has impacted my life or my family's life. That was a night that I pray I could forget, say it has not broken me, say that I am stronger than a single moment and move beyond as if it never happened. But unfortunately, as much as I try, this is something that haunts me daily. Our lives forever changed that evening. Mr. Brooks took an evening that was supposed to be filled with excitement, love and holiday spirit and turned it into a real life nightmare. November 21st of 2021, I witnessed the most horrific event I could ever have imagined leaving my house that evening. My children at the time of the parade were 11, victim LLL, nine, victim KKK, and six, innocent, full of life, love, compassion, and excitement for the holidays. That evening, Mr. Brooks stripped this from my children, leaving them physically hurt, scared, angry, confused, traumatized, and forever changed with the visions of what happened that night. I saw absolute fear and pain in my children's eyes they should never have to, had to experience in their entire life. I saw my daughter, victim LLL, lying in the road crying and yelling, who would do that? I saw my son, victim KKK, flipped on his back, crying in pain, not being able to move or feel his legs. I remember knowing we weren't safe and needing to leave telling my children to run as fast as they could and mentally knowing we needed to run, but physically feeling my body pull me back, not knowing if I am running them to safety or back to danger. I remember seeing parents laying on top of their children in fear and trying to protect them the best they could from what was happening. I remember sitting at every stoplight while, my dri while driving my children to the hospital trembling to the point the car was shaking. In complete fear, every car pulling up beside me was the person who hit my children. Yes, Mr. Brooks, I remember. I watched my son not be able to sit alone in a room for weeks. I watched my children not be able to sit still without being anxious and fidgeting for months. I watched my children wake up with nightmares to this day. 
I saw gut-wrenching guilt on my husband's face for feeling like he didn't protect his family. And to this day, I feel anger and hatred more than I realized I could ever could for a person I have never even met. But aside from all of that, I am thankful. Thankful that by some miracle, my family and I walked away that evening. Although I could not attend most of the trial in person, I did view either via Zoom or on TV. I viewed everything from the pre-trial, jury selection, and trial itself, and I am disgusted that a grown man could act the way Mr. Brooks acted during all of this. Mr. Brooks claims he was raised a Christian and his mother raised him better than he was acting at the beginning of the trial. But Mr. Brooks continued to be rude, selfish, and disrespectful, from sleeping during court, endless interruptions and outbursts, rude comments, facial expressions, and lack of remorse for his actions and how he was treating everyone in court, from the prosecutors, victims, witnesses, and judge herself. I never thought Mr. Brooks could make myself or my family feel victimized all over again, but he did. I keep remembering how Mr. Brooks was upset the detective in the investigation asked to speak to one of his children. I asked myself, it's not okay to speak to his child, but it's okay to intentionally hit two of my children and drive away? That's okay? Why my children? Why any children? How could someone do this? How could someone have no compassion for the victims, the families? We deserve answers. Our children deserve answers, true and honest answers. Never once did I see true remorse for anyone but himself or his family during the trial. Mr. Brooks also stated something along the lines of anyone who knows him or spends enough time with him knows he would never do something like that. But Mr. Brooks, you absolutely did. Mr. Brooks hit my children and so many more people and never once stopped. Not only did he kill, injure, and traumatize so many that night, he decided to victimize everyone again by forcing them to not only testify as to what happened because he felt compelled to plead not guilty, but he also forced these victims and family members, including my husband, to face the monster that did this and answer the questions he felt the need to ask. How can someone face each person on the stand knowing what was done that night, question them as if they were the ones on trial when all of the victims and witnesses were doing that night were creating memories? Unfortunately, memories were created, but not the memories I planned to have with my children. Instead, the fear I have seeing a maroon SUV driving towards myself or my family is now paralyzing. Seeing a vehicle drive too fast down any street makes me physically sick to my stomach. My children panic at the sight of an emergency vehicle. Seeing people run and yell unexpectedly, even if just for fun, makes my heart drop and my mind brings me back to the night of the parade hearing the screams, yells for help, and cries from that night will haunt me until the day I die. Those are the memories I have from the night. The only good that has come from this is Mr. Brooks will never be able to hurt another person outside of prison ever again. The guilty verdict and hopefully life plus sentence will protect anyone that may have been hurt by Mr. Brooks in the future, and that I can be thankful for. Please, on behalf of myself and my family, we ask Mr. Brooks to be sentenced to the fullest extent. Mother of victim KKK and LLL. Next to speak will be victim S. Um, I'm taking some notes and I was wondering, um, uh, it was a little confliction there. Is, uh, victim KKK eight or nine? I can't answer that, sir, but that was a written statement read from the mother of victim KKK. I apologize, Your Honor. I was just taking notes. My name is Kelly Grebo, and I was walking in the Christmas parade with my daughter, Adelia, on the 21st. I'm not one for public speaking, obviously, I'm very nervous, but I was given a chance to be a voice for my daughter, and, and I. That is what fueled me to stand here today. Now I can only <clears throat> tell you our story, but I believe the tragic events of that day have affected many of us in a similar manner. I can honestly say I have never felt the hatred I do for one person like I do this man. The very man that drove his vehicle into my nine-year-old baby girl who was excitedly walking in the Christmas parade. She was so excited to dress up that day as Cindy Lou Who. We spent weeks figuring out costume, her costume and picking her hairstyle 
she was excited to have her hair and makeup done and to help spread holiday cheer. To see her friends and her family that were there to be spectators at the parade that became witnesses to this horrible act themselves. So many lives were changed that day. Although many of us, for the most part, have healed physically, emotionally, many of us have been scarred. I have questioned whether those emotional scars will ever truly go away, remembering the roller coaster of emotions that day. And after being struck myself lying on the ground and seeing the tires pass directly in front of my face and just waiting for the pain to begin, being filled with absolute fear of not knowing where my daughter Adelia was or if she was okay, then running only to find her the way I did, the way so many of us found our loved ones that day, lying helpless on the cold, hard ground. My knees buckled the minute I got to her. Seeing my child, sorry. Seeing my child that this so-called sorry excuse for a man ran a 3,000 pound SUV into her tiny little body. There are so many times when I close my eyes, I still see my baby girl laying in the street helpless, not moving, just staring in complete shock, not even recognizing her own grandparents when they came to her side. Seeing that look in her eyes will forever be embedded in my mind. As a parent, we are supposed to be able to protect our children, and that day many of us were reminded of the ugly in this world, that no matter what we do, there will always be monsters like Darrell Brooks that are lurking around corners, just waiting for a chance to play those parts in our nightmares. Yet even after causing this much pain and destruction, he wasn't even happy with that. He didn't stop there. He took it upon himself to be his own representation, knowing full well he would be given the chance to question us as victims and rip open the wounds once again and show no remorse. I can tell you, sitting on the stand that day, reliving the horrific events, Having him look in my direction brought up so many memories and emotions of that night. Hearing his voice made me cringe with disgust and anger. He changed our Adelia that day. He stole her innocent, happy look on life and replaced it with fear and hate that no child at the now age of 10 should ever feel. Although those feelings are warranted, she was forced that day to see the ugly in this world also. And her joyous outlook on the holiday season was stolen. I'm not sure if she will ever again attend another parade, let alone a Christmas parade. I don't know when the unexplained loud noises will ever not, make, not take me back to that day and make me jump, make my heart rate increase. However, I do know every day is a new chance. We have to take back our lives and give this man no more than he has already taken. We are now stronger than we ever imagined we would have to be as a family and as a community, and that we that he cannot have. He does not deserve that. What Darrell Brooks does, however, deserve is to be does deserve is to be sentenced to the maximum time allotted for each one of his horrific convictions, as he has given us as a community a life sentence of these memories. Thank you. Thank you.
use them. Just start with like technical difficulties. We did um, swap out computers because we didn't have a power cord, but um, no, that one won't work. Miss Gussie's going to run and grab the power cord, and then it, it should work. We have, okay. There's a change between what we were using earlier, and that's why probably it's not recognizing the computer. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Okay. Simply wait for the technology, but we will do that if you want to wait. We'd like to wait if that's all right. No problem. Yes. <clears throat> you may need Miss Gussie back for that. <laughs> just hit, it's PowerPoint, so just hit enter. Thank you. <laughs> Looking back over the last 30, 358 days, some days are a complete blur. Or, or turn the microphone closer to you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Katie Pudliner, <coughs> mother of Tyler Pudliner. Thank you. Go ahead. Looking back over the last 358 days, some days are a complete blur, others are vivid as yesterday. At 4.39 p.m. on 11-21-21, changed my life, my sons, my family, my friends, and the Waukesha community. During the closing arguments, the defendant spoke of family. His grandmother released her statement to the media speaking of family. Through the past 360, 300, 358 days, we have heard from the Brooks family that the defendant has a mental illness as a reason for his decisions that evening, except the decision making goes back further than that. It seems the decision was made not to get help, not to stay medicated, etc., and said to use it as an excuse for poor, selfish decisions. My family almost lost the only son, the only grandson, the only nephew, and that was not our decision. As a parent, I have carried the guilt that I debated with my son that he had to go to the parade that day. It was mandatory for his grade. The Packers were playing. It was cold and windy. I had to use a life teaching moment. He made a commitment to the band. This was all part of it. He, reluctant, he left reluctantly. I talked to him shortly after I found a parking spot downtown to make sure he was warm enough and told him the general area where I was going to look for a spot to watch the band perform. From 4.33 to 4.34 p.m., I watched the South Band march and perform in front of me. As I was packing up my blankets and chair into the wagon, I noticed what I thought was between a 2008 to 2012 maroon red Ford Escape driving extremely fast past me. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I remember making the mental notes about the vehicle, the driver, turned to a friend sitting with me, and we were both in awe. Then we heard the screams and the sounds of things being hit, like when you bump into a construction barrel on the freeway. From 446 to 458 was complete chaos, fighting the crowd of people running out of the area, screaming shots fired, trying to find my son. As I approached the intersection of Main Street and Barstow, the area went completely dark, maybe only in my mind. As I searched for my son, asking people if they knew where he was. A familiar voice behind me said, he's over here. I turned to see him laying in the street with his feet pointing north. First, enter your pin to unlock the device. Apologies. We had no idea what had happened, only that he was tasting blood and that his stomach hurt. Soon EMTs were there and we went for a run up and down Main Street as 
as he was being helped before they had a true plan where they were going to stage the injured. He was taken off the gurney and placed in the street to await an ambulance. This is where we met our first hero of the journey. A complete stranger came to sit with us and help roll my son while he was vomiting blood from his injuries, help to keep him calm and confront and comfort his fears. That was the 18 minutes that felt like an hour. I remember looking around as I waited. Not too far in front of me was a very young officer with his rifle standing guard. To my left were two brothers that we had known from the band and baseball. One lying on the street, clearly injured, the other standing by. I felt completely helpless as I wanted to, to go and help them. But I couldn't leave my son injured. They say everything happens for a reason, something I have firmly believed. At 5.16 p.m., we were loaded into the ambulance, as I refer to it as a little ambulance that could. While in the middle of everything, it had a coolant leak. The smell of antifreeze will trigger me forever. We made it out to Oconomowoc, Walk, and I learned after that it made another run after that before it died. While my son was whisked away to emergency surgery, I had to start making phone calls, returning text messages, figuring out what was next. While he made it through surgery, will he make it through surgery? How bad were his injuries? After six days at the hospital, we were sent home. My athletic son, couldn't lift, over, lift our cats, pour a glass of milk, put his socks and shoes on. He has a scar almost two foot long, and as a catcher, he questioned his ability to be able to play the sport he loves, the sport that he eats, breathes, and sleeps. After missing school and work for almost two months, we were able to start to get back and work up to a full-time basis over the course of a month. One ling lingering injury brought questions if he could play ball for what would be the first full season of his high school career. COVID had canceled and shortened the prior two. April 6th, he took to the field with that bandmate that was lying in the street just a few feet from us just three months earlier. As we tried to find the sense of normal in between doctor's appointments and procedures. Next one, please. Through the process and the journey of the judicial system, we have found a new family, one that can relate to the horror, the fear, the trauma of that night, changing our lives forever. The criminal complaint had listed 62 named victims, now survivors, six that gained their wings. What it did not include were the 16 jurors that had also become victims of the defendant's actions that night, while the named victims, their families and friends had to relive that night they were experiencing firsthand. Mrs. Edwards' statement asked that we forgive her grandson blaming the mental illness, not encouraging him to take ownership for his actions. She said that she lost a grandson, his mother lost a son, his children lost a father. That isn't completely a true statement, as they will be able to talk to him, send him letters, visit him, hopefully in a maximum security prison. They seem to forget there is a mother that can't kiss her son goodnight, a father that can't play ball with his son, a brother that can't fight with his brother and still be his best friend. There are th three children that can't call their mother for advice, go shopping, plan their weddings, or have them watch over them as they reach for their dreams. There are numerous grandchildren that won't get to go to grandma's anymore, get spoiled and sent home, hyped on sugar and love. There are teenagers that had to grow up way too quickly, having to make adult decisions about their future. There are girls that may never dance again without fear. 
their innocence taken away by a selfish decision. There is a grandfather that cannot tell the family stories anymore. He can't watch his wife dance. These families will forever be missing their loved ones. They can't call them, write a letter, or visit them. Nothing will bring back the son, the mom, the daughter, the grandma, and the grandfather to these families. Nothing can restore the innocence lost to, these, to ease their fear. But this community came together to lift up each other up, support each other, looked after those that were in their worst moments, celebrated the wins along the way, returning to the dance floor, dancing in the streets, and playing baseball. The prosecution team did an amazing job representing everyone of the, pl of the plaintiffs in this case. Thank you. The victim witness team was so caring and diligent in keeping us informed being whenever there was a question that came up. Pepper, who greeted us every time we came to the courthouse, she put a smile on everyone's face, brought a little humor or a caring snuggle. You can do the last one, Tom. Your Honor, you are the standard that should be set across the country. Your patience, your diligence will never be forgotten. From the self act selfish actions A one person came to a community, came from a, excuse me, from one selfish actions of one person came a community rising like a phoenix, stronger than ever, stronger together. I ask that you hand down the maximum possible sentence without parole in prison so that everyone in our Waukesha strong community can heal, remember, grow, and never have to look back. <laughs> it's a separate PowerPoint. It's, yeah, if you just. Oh, here's Chris. Oh. I'm Tyler Pudliner, uh, victim O. Your Honor, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today and share my impact statement with the court. It has been a long time coming, but I cannot thank the courts enough for giving not only myself, but all of us who have been affected the opportunity to share our stories. First, I would like to start off with you, Judge Doro. Thank you, Your Honor. We have all been going through these proceedings for almost a year now, and it is almost hard to believe that this is the first time that we've gotten the opportunity to communicate with you directly. I understand now that this is how the process takes place. Now since the beginning of these proceedings, I've obviously gone through a lot of emotions as having been a victim and survivor in this case. I hate to say it like this, but it seems that, that for a greater portion of the year, and especially throughout the most recent proceedings, and my mother can confirm this, I've been somewhat angry towards you, Judge Doro. And I would now like to apologize for that. Maybe it's because I either did not understand or did not want to become aware of how lengthy the process was. There have been multiple occasions where I have gotten very mad or annoyed due to your rulings that either didn't go the prosecution's way or that I personally felt shouldn't have been made. Obviously, there are also multiple occasions where these disruptions that would continuously be, continuously be made by the defendant would take up way too much time and cause way too many delays throughout the trial portion of these proceedings. It would stress all of us out more than we should have ever been, to say the least. I would keep asking my mother, other families involved, the prosecution, and wit victim witness teams, why can't Judge Duro do more to stop the disruptions? Why did she let that one testimony go on for way longer than it should have? But in all thanks to those amazing people sitting behind me, I was able to get the clarification and understanding that I need to calm down and help me understand that we were making steps forward in the process. And I wanted, and that we were going to finally arrive at the finish line as winners. That's why I wanted to start off by thanking you first today, Judge Duro. I am very glad that we have finally arrived at this point in the process where I can say that you did an amazing job throughout the entire process. You have not only shown myself or just the court, but an entire nation and world, um, for, that, for that matter, that you conducted these proceedings with the utmost respect and decorum to all of the parties involved. Lastly, Your Honor, I want to acknowledge your sainthood. 
Your devotion to this trial can never be matched. Your fair rulings, passion for this case, and kindness to everyone is more than everyone could have asked for, and for that I again thank you. You have truly become like a mother and a true hero to this community, and that, we, and for that we appreciate you, Judge Doro. I would also like to thank this amazing prosecution team, Sue, Leslie, Zach, Tom, Christy, and Ryan. You guys have been the glue that has held us together throughout this entire process over the past year. You've all taken extra time out of your day to stay late and either be able to answer all of our questions or just talk and reassure us that even though with all those sleepless nights and countless hours of delay, we would be okay. I can confidently say that I don't think there could have been a better team put together to represent us as the plaintiffs in this matter. Just like Judge Doro, all of you have shown the passion, blood, sweat, and tears and extraordinary effort that has been poured into this case to give us the justice that many have desired and deserve. Consider yourselves true heroes to this community as well. I would also like to highlight Jen and her extraordinary team at Victim Witness Assistance. Again, a group of truly amazing people that I can't say enough words about to describe their amazing work. If we needed a shoulder to cry on, they were there. If we needed to make that late night phone call to get the answers we desired, they answered. We can truly not thank you guys enough for all your hard work and unmeasurable amount of effort that you gave us during this case to our families. And you cannot forget about personally my favorite employee in the entire courthouse, Pepper. You know how they say a dog is a man's best friend. Well, Pepper is an entire community's best friend. I personally, and I'm sure that I could speak for all of us when I say this, could not be more thankful for all the donations that have been made, or have made Pepper possible. Jen and her staff have done an amazing job keeping her in line while she did what any dog does best. Gives us so much unconditional love that for a split second, you feel like all the problems are gone. Once again, I cannot thank everyone who represented us as the state of Wisconsin. You guys did one hell of a job throughout this process and have truly become a special part of this group. Um, finally, I want to take the time to describe how the events that occurred on November 21st, 2021 have affected my family and myself. No one thinks um, that something like those horrendous acts committed by the defendant on 11-2021 will ever happen to you. Christy, if you could please. I want you to look at that, Mr. Brooks. <coughs> That's what you did to me that night. That's us in the ER, waiting. I remember bits and pieces, but that is what happened. If you could go on to the next slide, please, Christy. Throughout the past year, I have become very close to other families involved in this matter. All the pictures there have what kept me going. The sport of baseball and all the other families affected in that community. I've gained more little brothers than I can say and an entire new baseball team to live out the, the rest of this life with. Next slide, please. I've also met so many new friends post-11-2021. A new grandmother to add to such a wonderful family, a new, another new brother in that instance that have just helped me get through everything. And it's kept us stronger through the whole process. Next slide, please, Christy. I've also gotten to become closer to other groups that were affected. Last Saturday, I marched with the Milwaukee Dancing Grannies in their Christmas parade. Veterans Day. Ve uh, Veterans Day parade, yeah, my bad, <laughs> sorry. Um, coming together with other groups like this is something that has, again, shown that we are very strong. We are stronger than the defendant, and we are an entire community that has shown that strength. These memories are what have kept us going and will forever keep us going in this process. Next slide, please, Christy. As I stated before, um, baseball is a sport that has specifically kept me going. Wrestling is another love. I've gotten to meet some very cool wrestlers, uh, Braun Strowman, to name a few, or, and Ric Flair. Um, a race car driver, a local race car driver that I pit for at Slinger Speedway has basically been another grandfather throughout this entire process. He spent every day with us at the hospital for the week I was hospitalized, except Thanksgiving. Um, I've gained another brother who's pictured there at that wrestling event with another part of my truly amazing and big family that I've gained out of this. Christian Yelich, a brewer, and my favorite player and now manager of the Brewers Craig Council. You go to the next slide, please. Finally, this right here, this is me and my buddy Eric. We were both affected that day, and we made the return within three months of everything happening to come back and play the sport that we love. We did not stay down, we did not cry, you know, didn't let it get to us. We came back stronger than ever. Yeah, we might have lost, but we played hard and truly showed this entire community that we are stronger together. 
and we are stronger than you. I just want to uh, also address one more thing to Mr. Brooks. These are um, two quotes that have gotten me through this entire process. You can mark it down in your Bible if you want for this one. It's Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The second one, also to go with his grandmother's statement, I picked it up from the book and movie The Shack, written by William P. Young. The quote is, Forgiveness in no way requires that you trust the one you forgive. Forgiveness is not about forgetting. It is about letting go of another person's throat. And I do want to acknowledge that I am letting go of your throat, Mr. Brooks, but I have not forgiven you. Thank you, for your, thank you Your Honor, for the chance to speak today. Thank you to both of you. Hello, my name is Sasha Catalan. I was 17 years old when the Waukesha Parade incident occurred. I was in my last year of high school thinking it was going to be the best senior year ever. Although I pushed through and made it to the end, it definitely was not easy for me or for any of us of that. After that, one night, that changed our lives. I was in the Waukesha South marching band as a clarinet player. How am I doing now? That's really hard to answer because some days I get scared to leave my house, especially now since the holidays are coming around. Even when it's the simplest holidays, my mind always finds a way to go back to that parade incident. Since that day, I don't really know how to act on many events, whether good or bad. What I mean by this is that I don't really know how to show my emotions as much anymore. Before, I used to open up and could easily be read as a book, but now even my mom wonders what goes through my head, and honestly, I wish she knew. But I know that if I were to tell her, she'd be worried for me, which is the last thing that I want. Sometimes I think of what-if situations since that day, that if I were to take the place, of one of those people who have passed, if it would have had been better. Although I am grateful to have received a chance to continue and to make something out of my life for the better, I get haunted by these thoughts. I used to never think this way, which scares me the most. Not sure whether to live actively and freely, like as if nothing ever happened, or to watch my back on the slightest of email and the reason stated in the request just would note again i didn't ask for the email addresses they were provided uh, but under the circumstances i think that's appropriate okay with that i presume the state has the next group available yes we're ready to go your honor thank you all right then go ahead please <clears throat> yeah. on november 21st you killed my mother and in this courtroom, I watched you run her down and her broken body slide across the concrete. This woman loved and she was loved. You ran her down like she was nothing. And since that day, you have shown no remorse. You'd offered no explanation for your atrocities. It offends me that you're sitting here breathing while she is not. You are a monster. You deserve contempt and death. Sadly, with no death penalty in this state, I can only hope they lock you away someplace so deep the rats chew on your fingers at night. As for me, this will never be over until the day I'm pissing on your grave. I think it would be fair to say that for your crimes, even God hates you. If you could just tell me, oh, go ahead. Yeah, for the record, Your Honor, that was the son of victim two. B. Um, if I could first thank the court, uh, you, Your Honor, and your staff for getting us here today. I don't know how you did. Uh, you kept us under four weeks, and uh, this is all going to be wrapped up, you know, before the first anniversary, and that means a lot. So I thank you for that. And uh, if I could thank everybody at the prosecution table, our real-life Avengers, 
I mean, you guys did everything you could for us, and I'm, I'm forever grateful. Thank you. And uh, I couldn't not thank Jen Dunn and her staff. I mean, she took all of us, supported us, made us into a family, and with, without them, I don't think I could have gotten through this trial. And Mr. Brooks, I hope as I read my statement, you continue to roll your eyes. I hope you continue to laugh and just show how bored and unmoved you are by all of this, because I think that's important. It's important for the world to see that evil can be a tangible, living, breathing thing. I think it's important for the world to see what human rot looks like. And to all the survivors, every time he puts his hand on that empty cavity where his heart should be, I hope you all smile and I hope you take solace in the fact that today is our day. Today is for us. Today is so we can take our handful of dirt, throw it on his grave and move on. Because that's what we all need and that's what we deserve. My name is Chris Owen, and I am the plaintiff. I'm here on behalf of another plaintiff, my mother, Leanna Joy Owen. Lee Owen was a mother, a grandmother, a best friend, an apartment manager, and a dancing granny. The reason none of the witnesses saw her in this courtroom is because she was executed by a child-killing sex offender. And we are both injured parties. My whole family is an injured party. To my kids, Lee Owen was nanny. And Nanny spoiled her grandkids every chance she got. On every birthday, she would call and sing happy birthday to their voicemail so they could hear it the first thing in the morning. She went on a tour of my son's summer camp. She danced in the same parades as my youngest daughter. She wanted my oldest daughter to use her car to learn how to drive so she could teach her like she taught me. And all of that has been ripped away. But the defendant's conscience is clear. To my dad, Lee Owen was the love of his life. They met when she was 16, and he taught her how to drive. From that point on, they stayed in each other's lives. And even though they divorced, she was still his best friend. They spent a lot of time together, and she was the only one that, who could get him out of the house. Now my dad has nightmares of her body flying through the air and shattering against concrete. But Mr. Brooks' conscience is clear. To my brother and I, Lee Owen was our mother. A mother who, even when she was struggling, was always there for us. She was supportive of us. She always told us how proud she was of us. Growing up, all my friends and my brother's friends knew they were welcomed at our house. When they were in trouble, having problems at home, or just had to get away, she always let them stay as long as they needed to. And for years, every time I came home from the Marine Corps, she got all those same friends together so I could see everybody and spend time with them. She was the one that made sure everyone got their Christmas list out on time. She made the best eggnog I ever had. And she made my grandma's mac and cheese whenever we were together. She recently renewed her passport so she could visit my wife and I in Turkey and travel the world with us. She also couldn't wait to visit Machu Picchu with my brother. It was her dream trip. Out of all the places in the world, that was the one place she had to visit before she died. And now the best we can do is lay her ashes there. But Daryl Brooks' conscience is clear. And I believe him. Out of everything he said in this courtroom, I believe that is the one truth he told. I mean, how else could he make a witness look at each of his battered friends that he ran over and ask, how do you know who this is? Throughout her life, Lee Owen was a hardworking woman. That's why when she found herself on hard times, she was able to overcome them. Even though it took years, she dug herself out of a deep financial hole so she could live the life she wanted, the life she deserved. And she was in the middle of doing just that on the evening of November 21st, 2021. And I know this is corny and cliche to say, but Lee Owen wasn't 71 years old. She was 71 years young. She was one of the most active people I knew. She just didn't have it in her to sit still. She always had to be moving or doing something, and this often involved people. She was very social and loved being around those she cared about, and people loved her back. She had a knack for making you feel good about yourself without even trying because she always found the good in people. Even when it was to her detriment, it never dissuaded her from helping people any way she could. Without judgment, without demand for repayment, or feeling she was owed anything. She did it because she knew it was the right thing to do and it made her feel good. She accepted people for who they were and made people feel good about themselves. That is what the world lost, and you have the audacity to tell this court that your conscience is clear. 
I'm sorry, Mr. Brooks. There's not a human with a soul on this planet who could snuff that light out, who could steal Lee Owen from this world and have a clear conscience. And that is why you hear the term monster. That is why you hear the term demon. You know, I saw you that day. It was just after you ran over the Catholics. I saw you hanging out of the window, looking back with a smile of satisfaction on your face, laughing at an inside joke that at the time I didn't get, the punchline escaping me. I didn't get it when my mom didn't respond to my texts. I didn't get it when she didn't answer my phone calls. I didn't get it the first couple hours my brother spent looking for. I didn't get it until my wife sent me a video of you running over children in the parade. That's when I got the punchline. And it hit me like the red SUV, Mr. Brooks. I saw a pure, unrepentant evil in your face that day, and it disgusts me that you are allowed to exist. And I know the answer to the question that everyone keeps asking. I know why you did this. You did this simply because you were not in a cage. That is what I find mind-boggling. And how dare anyone say the system failed him? The system failed every one of us whose only mistake was to bring their families in the vicinity of Mr. Brooks. That poor excuse for a man should not have been on the streets. That is the failure, period. But enough about him, because today is not about him. It's about us and what we lost. I lost my mom, Lee Owen, and I wasn't always a good son. I could be selfish sometimes. I could be mean. But no matter how angry or standoffish I got, she would bend over backwards for me, even when I didn't deserve it. And now I can never tell her I'm sorry. I can never tell her I should have been more grateful. I can never tell her how much I need her in my life. Yeah, shake your head, shake your head. You know, because that is what you took from me. And there's, there's nothing this court can do that would provide justice in my eyes. So all I ask is that you rot, and you rot slow. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Um, th thank you for the opportunity uh, that you're providing both to myself and uh, to the rest of the families and uh, acquaintances of uh, the folks associated with this, uh, with this horrible case. Um, my name is Michael Carlson, and I'm appearing here today both as an individual and a brother uh, to one of the victims of November 21st. I'm here today as well as a plaintiff joining a criminal complaint against Mr. Brooks with a claim against him for the damage that he has brought not only to Waukesha, but to my family. And I'm also appearing as a posthumous spokesman for the victim, my sister Tamara Durant, who can't appear here today on her own behalf because Mr. Brooks killed her. In my personal aspect, I wish I could as easily forget about Mr. Brooks as he has seemingly forgotten about himself. Every day, since November 21st has been, been, been framed by what he did in my own life, in our family's life. It is the reality I wake to. It is the reality I head to work to. It is the reality I confront as I try to fall asleep. It's the reality I confront as I go about the things I do during the day, my attempts to work, attempts to manage a household and be present for my children and maintaining any sort of notion of normalcy in our life. But all these actions are simply a pantomime, Mr. Brooks, to forget that my sister was so stupidly and so needlessly killed by you. Perhaps you can forget what you did, but I can't. November 21 looms as a ground zero day in the story of my life, as I know it does in the life of so many others. <clears throat> I appear today also as a plaintiff. Mr. Brooks, you asked the court to identify a plaintiff many times during the, the course of the trial. Here I am. I'm one of many. We the people have brought this case and these judgments against you, Mr. Brooks. 
They reflect our values as a people and are enacted through laws passed by our legislatures, enforced by our law, law enforcement, and, and administered through our courts. We the people find you guilty. A lifetime is a long time to think and to spout nonsense. And Mr. Brooks, I want you to take no comfort in your, in your future here in this comic book cartoon world that you've created for yourself involving, involving the flags and, and barcodes and birth certificates. This is all nonsense, the stuff of teenage boys on the internet. That's not why you're here today. That's not why we're here today. We're here today and you are here today because you got in a car and instead of hitting the brakes, ran over children, elderly, and my sister, Tamara. I don't want you to live in the comfort of that delusion as you live there in the court, as you live there in the prison, convincing yourself that you're the victim of something, of some crazy internet conspiracy. You're not Mr. Brooks. You're guilty only of your own actions on that day, actions that you had an infinite number of times to stop. Any number of times you could have just hit those brakes, turned the other direction. As it stands, I'm, not a, pla I'm a plaintiff, but I'm not a victim. The victim is Tamara Durand, my sister. She can't appear, appear her on her own behalf because she's dead. She died when Mr. Brooks killed her on November 21st. Because Tamara cannot be here to speak, I will speak for her. Daryl Brooks, you took my life. I wish you hadn't. I had people to live for, people who needed me. My parents who are aging, my children who need their mother to help them make sense of their worlds, to cheer them on, to help them into their adulthood, to become friends with them. I have my grandson who relies on me, his grandmother, as much as I relied upon my own grandmother as I was growing up. I had people who needed me, people who needed me to cheer them on, to have me bring goodwill to the hospital bed where they were in, or their families in the waiting room, who needed the comfort and prayers I brought to them in their moments of pain. I have friends who near to hear from me and families that need my early morning phone calls. I had places I wanted to see and things I needed to do. The only saving grace is I didn't know what hit me and who would have ever guessed? Who could ever believe it? It's no surprise to anyone who knew me. After you hit me in that car, I got back up and kept dancing. I hardly skipped a beat. I didn't know you, Mr. Brooks. If the picture were reversed, if you were the stranger in the street in pain, needing care or comfort, know that I would have helped you. I ran towards pain and I ran into danger in my life. All you had to do was ask and you might have danced along with us. It was a parade after all. We both died in vain on November 21st, Mr. Brooks. I died to life and you now die to the world. We leave lives behind, family behind, children behind us. We both leave dreams, we leave choices, we leave successes we leave failures behind us. I die to mine in an instant, you die to yours over countless days. May the God I'm with grant you the courage to confront what you've done and to remember your own name. It's the least you might do for all these that you've left behind us who will never, who can never forget. Mr. Brooks, I'd also like to acknowledge that over these last couple months, I've sent you a couple letters in prison urging you to stand up, to be a man, to grow up, to accept accountability for what you've done. I also use those letters to share with you the love of the God that I believe in and that I know my sister Tamara believed in. I use those letters to share with you, especially the story of the final act of Christ on the cross, where he is hanging between two murderers, and he turns to the one and he, and, and he give, gives them forgiveness. I urge you to remember, Mr. Brooks, that there were two murderers on that day. 
one who mocked the holy living in God, and one who accepted accountability for who he was. Your Honor, I urge you to provide Mr. Brooks a lifetime in prison to please contemplate that story and to remember his name and to contemplate which side of Christ he wishes to hang on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The family of victim A is going to speak next. Um, they do have some minors with them, so I'd just like to give the um, camera a second to adjust for that. And also, one of the minors um, does wish to make a statement and is somewhat vertically challenged. Um, I'm wondering if she should stand over so that you may see her or... Um, sure. Oh, she... Taken out before I ha uh, have them come up, I believe Mr. Brooks was uh, attempting to get the court's attention. So let me address him quickly. Um, I wanted the uh, order of the court, if I may, really quick, pertaining to the... Um, the last speaker, I have an issue with, if you would, if it pleases the court, we can address it later, or if you want to address it now, I don't, Mr. I'm not Brooks, sure. Is, these are sentencing remarks. I'm not going to interrupt those sentencing remarks to have you address him individually. No, I'm not talking about addressing him individually. Mr. Brooks, we're going to continue. I'm not sure what you could possibly bring to the court's attention about a speaker who's already made a statement? A very valid issue that I can bring to the you court. You can put it in writing, sir, while you're sitting there, and if it's something I need to address, I will. But I'm not going to disrupt what's happening right now to address that. You need to put it in writing. All right, go ahead, uh, Ms. So, put it in writing that... Mr. Brooks, please put it in writing. That's if you the, need same, some paper, that's the then. same person you had to worked with the father of, right? Go ahead, um, Ms. Dunn. The record the same speaks for itself. All of those issues were previously put on the record. There's no need for you to make any that commentary is him though, about right? it. He did work with his father, though, right? Mr. Brooks, stop. If you interrupt me again, yeah. you're going to risk going into the other courtroom. I'm not going to have so you gonna hold degrade me in the integrity of these proceedings. I'm not, I'm not and the attempting to cause of what's a controversy. Going on right I just now wanted to know. That by the, once again trying to derail what's happening man, and take you the focus off. always talk of, about somebody trying to derail something. As if that that was the plan, like somebody coming here Brooks, to derail something. Mr. Brooks, I'm advising something. you to be quiet, or I will clear this courtroom. And under Illinois versus Allen, you will lose your right to be present while the remainder of these individuals give their statements. Okay, well, come on with it. Once they start, I expect you to be come quiet. Come on with it, because that that's what you've been waiting to do the whole listen time. Some shit. Listen up and listen what she has to say. All right. God damn. Sir, you're gonna have to be removed. I'm sorry. I can't tolerate that from anyone. Mr. Brooks, my admonishment to you is the next person's going to get up and they're going to start their statement. And okay, yeah, but you made it seem like I'm trying to purposely interrupt that. Mr. Brooks? And that's, I don't think I'm that that's fair to, to them, do that. Please be quiet. Okay. Yeah, I still have the uh, First Amendment right to be heard and to, and to, be, to speak. I still have that right. Mr. Brooks, this is a sentencing hearing. I don't the care what it is. is. You're not right. going to continue. He is arguing you're with not, me. He is now forced You're not going to continue. You're not going to continue. Everyone is moved to the next courtroom, and I'll make the appropriate findings when I'm able to do that without So can I get a finding of fact? Can I get I'm a legal finding of fact? Because I don't agree to a stop it.
Um, first of all, we are back on the record. Mr. Brooks has been removed to the other courtroom. Uh, Mr. Brooks, you're not muted, so if you're going to keep talking, I'll have to mute you. All right, so I've muted him, as you can see. And here, um, he was not muted initially. Um, I will advise there is a headset next to him should he wish to uh, put those on. Uh, this court, frankly, acted a bit more swiftly than I have in the past due to the nature of the proceedings, the history of Mr. Brooks's outbursts during the trial, and uh, him attempting to address an issue that was addressed by this court the very first time I ever uh, had Mr. Brooks in the courtroom dealing with um, victim C's father, and, a, and this court uh, certainly working with him in the past. I stand by the record that was made at that time. All of that was put on the record, and um, it's not an issue this court, frankly, needs to address today. It is, frankly, a blatant attempt by Mr. Brooks to be disruptive, uh, to take the focus off of what I think is some very emotionally charged victim uh, statements here today from uh, those who have been involved with the dancing grannies and uh, people who lost their lives on November 21 of 2021. Um, I warned him a couple of times, even in my words, backtracked a little, told him I would have the state uh, put, have the next victim <laughs> make the statement, and if he then interrupted, I would have him removed. Um, he wanted to debate with me, he interrupted me repeatedly, and at that point <clears throat> there was also an outburst by a member of the gallery. I addressed that, um, and uh, then I indicated the courtroom would uh, be cleared. Um, I think I owe it to the individual who was kicked out because I've given Mr. Brooks this opportunity on many occasions. If that individual would like to come back into the courtroom and can do so respectfully without an outburst, they are invited back in by this court. Mr. Brooks, I will also advise you that you are welcome back into this courtroom if you can abide by the rules of decorum and civility. Um, while you have a right to be present for this sentencing hearing, you do not have a right uh, to interrupt the court, to disrupt the court, uh, and to be defiant, which is how I would describe your very recent behavior. Um, and that is why this court, under the authority in Illinois versus Allen, uh, did remove you from the courtroom. I have the ability, of course, with the technology. He's able to hear, he's able to see, we are able to see him. He's muted right now. Um, and uh, while I attempted to have him appear without being muted, he uh, spoke over me. Um, if he wants to come back in before it is his turn to speak to the court and present uh, individuals who wish to speak on his behalf, he needs to simply ask the bailiff and then, of course, uh, abide by the rules of civility and decorum. Um, it's, of course, a very emotional day for many people here, if not all. Um, and I think even more today than any other day, um, respect needs to be what guides everyone in this courtroom um, and not interrupting and not having outbursts no matter how difficult the situation may get at times. So I've made the record. Um, I will unmute, um, but if there is any interruption whatsoever, I'll have to uh, mute him once again. So the unmute is off. And once again, I've confirmed that the technology is working and... Um, um, all right, what do you need to do? He will be able to hear. He may not be able to see the individuals speaking. I would note all, the podium is behind him in any event, and I don't believe he's turned back at all during this hearing, and um, it's standard, really, protocol for an inmate to remain looking forward, so I don't see any issue with that. He will be able to hear. Um, with that, um, 
we, we will need the screen share um, for the next speakers, Your Honor. There's some photos that we'd like to display just to right. give you a heads up on that. I believe Madam Clerk will be able to do that for us. <coughs> When we get that up and running, then the next person can come on up. Looks like it's working. All right, thank you, sir. If, as a reminder, if you would at least let me know your name if you want to, or son of victim so-and-so, that would be very helpful as I am trying to take notes of everyone who is making a statement. Um, no, you are not muted. I expect you to be quiet as the proceedings continue. I was just asking was I muted. I didn't know. You just said I was muted. I'm sorry for the interruption, sir. Please continue, or please start. My name is Marshall Sorensen, and I am son to a murdered mother, Virginia Sorensen. On a day that I was planning to put up a Christmas tree with my family, I received a call from my dad that would turn my whole family's world upside down. When I answered the phone, my dad told me something happened to your mother during the parade and she didn't make it. I said, what do you mean she didn't make it? My dad proceeded to tell me that she was killed. Of course, I didn't believe him at first, but when I hung up the phone, reality set in. As I wiped the tears from my eyes, I thought to myself how I was going to tell my two little girls as they wait in the other room to put up the Christmas tree, that they will never see their grandma again. As a parent, one of the hardest things to endure is to see your family in pain. Witnessing my daughter's hearts get shattered into a million pieces in an instant that night, trying to understand what happened to their Grammy is something I wish to this day I could make go away. I love my mom unconditionally and so did my family. My mom would jump at the opportunities to spend time with my daughters. I was blessed with having that opportunity with my mom, but my girls were cheated out of that because of the acts of one evil person. Mr. Brooks, you had mentioned that you will never get to be able to get the chance to hold your grandchild. To that, I say good. Maybe then, while you're locked behind bars, you will experience a little bit of the pain that you inflicted on six families when you killed their loved ones during a Christmas parade. My family will never get the chance to hug my mom one last time and say goodbye because of your actions. You will never understand what you took from my family and by your actions in court, you don't seem to care either. You murdered my mom and for that reason, I'm asking the judge to sentence you to life in prison without parole. I continue to have a hard time understanding why such a loving person like my mom had her life ended in a tragic way. But I do have some peace knowing that she left this earth doing something she loved. I encourage people now, after a year, that if someone asks you how my mom died, Virginia Sorensen, that you respond with, let me tell you how she lived, because that is what made her so special to so many people. When I was a kid, most of my superheroes wore capes. As of today, myself and family, we have a new one and she wears a robe. Thank you, Judge Darrow. Words cannot express my family's gratitude with the time and effort you put into this trial. I want to also thank Sue, Zach, Leslie, Detective Casey, Jen, Pepper, the witnesses, the jury, for the sacrifices they made so justice could be served. Lastly, I want to thank the city of Waukesha for their community of love and support they displayed towards our family during this time. Going forward, my family re will refuse to live in fear because of the acts of one evil person. My family will continue to attend parades and at this year's Waukesha Christmas Parade, we plan on walking with the dancing grannies. We will do this in remembrance of my mom and show that we are stronger together. I ask you today to please remember the picture shown on the screen during this year's Waukesha Christmas Parade. This picture was taken before a previous parade. My hope for you is that it reminds you of the true representation of what the Waukesha Christmas Parade stood for 
before this tragic event, which is the unconditional love between families while celebrating the spirit of Christmas. May angels watch over you and you remain strong. I would like now to bring up my daughter, Brooke, to say a couple words about her grandma. She held the banner with my mom at previous parades as shown in the picture above. Thank you for being here, young lady. What would you like to tell me? Hello, my name is Brooke Sorensen. I am Virginia Sorensen's granddaughter. The things I that the things I miss about my grandma are me and my sister Mackenzie doing foot races around the driveway, and my grandma would do commentary and time us. She always wait. Yeah. She always cheered us on at all of our activities. I would DJ at dance at granny parties and carry the banner at parades with my grandpa while Grammy danced. When we would get on the school bus, she would say, reading is the key to learning to be nice, kind, brave, and angels watch over you. After school, we would talk on the porch. Other times when we came, when we came over to our house, we would play games together, go to the playground, have drawing contests, dance parties, and work on granny routines. She would give us snacks when we watched some of our favorite movies like Polar Express and Coco. When we first found out that she was gone, I started to cry, and I would cry every night. I missed her so much and still do today. Daryl Brooks, you took her from me, my sister, and my family. The things we will miss the most are not seeing her again, her smile, her laugh, being able to talk to her, and doing fun things with her. My sister and I pray every night for our Grammy and our family. Grammy, I'll see you in my dreams. I'm being told Mr. Brooks would like to come back. Before I do that, sir, I need a pledge from you that you will abide by the rules of courtesy and decorum and you will not interrupt. Can you do that, sir? I'm not going to interrupt. All right, then I will give him that opportunity. Uh, to come back, we'll clear the courtroom while we do that. Thank you, we are take a brief recess.
been advised that there may be an issue with the screen in front of Mr. Brooks, but I would note that the large monitor that's directly above the witness stand and the other monitor, which is closer to Mr. Brooks behind uh, the clerk, has been working the entire time. Um, Zach may be coming in to look at it, but we'll keep going while that happens since uh, we are able to see and hear that way through the monitors. So um, please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Thank you Your Honor. I didn't know it caused that disruption. Can the state put something up and I'll... And that, was the, that was like way earlier. There you go. It's working. It's working. Okay, great. It's working. <laughs> All right, my apologies, sir, for that interruption. Yeah, it was almost second. Judge, I popped the power button. All right, well, there's nothing on it. Yeah, we did that. That's there's nothing on it at the moment. Okay, yeah, as long as you got that, you should be fine. Court, really quick. No, we're going to keep going, sir. I just I just wanted to apologize for the outburst. That's, okay. that's all I wasn't to address anything. All right, I appreciate anything. that, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I really do. All right, go ahead, sir. My name is Sean Sorensen, Virginia Sorensen's oldest son. Without warning, on a joy-filled Sunday in November, our family and others were devastated by an unfathomable act of evil. My mother, Virginia Sorensen, Jenny, a loving and devoted grandmother to six, mother to three, sister to three, and wife of 56 years to my father and friend to countless others was taken from us for no <laughs> comprehensible reason. My mom didn't let her age of 79 slow her down, be it the dancing grannies, her horses, dogs, cats, chickens, travel, working as a medical records nurse, holiday get-togethers, the occasional brandy old-fashioned and having sleepovers and movie parties with her grandchildren. She enjoyed the company of others and was always up for an adventure. She never tired of listening to her grandchildren's dreams and inspiring them to shoot for the stars. She was so proud of all six of them in this photo. Carter, Claire, Gabrielle, Savannah, Brooke, and Mackenzie. She was killed doing something she loved and enjoyed with the dancing grannies. And although we were denied the chance to be her with her when she passed, we know she was surrounded by friends and the caring strangers who sought to save her life. So we find comfort that she not die alone. She was a compassionate person. She was always telling us, God bless you or angels watch over you. She will be missed with an aching emptiness in all our hearts. Judge Doral, thank you for overseeing this trial. You define excellence in your profession, and we are so grateful you were assigned to this case. Thank you to the 12 jurors of this strong community who carefully and unbiasedly listened to the evidence and brought back 76 guilty verdicts. Thank you, Sue Opper, Leslie Basie, Zach Wichow, and the entire Waukesha District Attorney's team for ensuring Mr. Brooks would not escape the consequences of his despicable actions. Thank you, Detective Tom Casey, and the many law enforcement officers of Waukesha and other jurisdictions who investigated, collected evidence, and testified to ensure Dale Brooks will never be a free man. Detective Casey came to my dad's house in the early morning hours of November 22nd to deliver the heart-wrenching confirmation that my mother had passed, and he has greeted us every day in court since then. I want to thank the Victim Witness Program, Jen Dunn, her staff, and their best comfort dog, Pepper. 
for their kindness and constant comfort to all the families affected this past year. She and her office have been a rock for us to cling to when events have threatened to emotionally overwhelm us. I want to thank the Waukesha Women's Center for supporting Corey Runkle and Erica Patterson in their testimony against Mr. Brooks and his abuse and the good that the center does for other abused women. I want to thank the first responders and medical personnel at the parade who rendered aid to the injured and attempted to save my mother's life that night. And a nurse that we met at the memorial one night by chance, Sarah, who held my mother's hand that night. But she was already dead. A severed spine, multiple skull fractures, pelvic fractures, and her Christmas hat wedged under the windshield wipers of the Ford SUV. There was no ambulance ride or hospital stay. She was gone in a split seconds after Mr. Brooks smashed into her. But she will live on forever in our hearts. Finally, I would like to thank the Waukesha community and thousands of others for their outpouring of love and prayers to the families and victims of this unspeakable tragedy. I have few words for Mr. Brooks. Just saying that name brings anger and hatred into my heart. And I want to move forward after this sentencing with the happy memories I hold of my mother. I sat silently almost every day in this courtroom, bit my tongue, restrained myself from jumping over this divide to administer my thoughts of justice. As Mr. Brooks droned on about where the plaintiff was in this case, who the plaintiff was in this case. You've already heard, there are many plaintiffs here. I'm here, right now. I've been here all along. And now he gets to hear from me and we'll hear from many other plaintiffs before this day is over. He is simply a repulsive man who has shown zero remorse for his actions and depraved indifference to life. His fake tears in court were never for those harmed, but only for himself and the freedom he has lost. His narcissistic behavior, disgusting trial antics, and defiance to accept any accountability displays how truly unworthy he is of anyone's forgiveness. While we lost my mom instantly, I hope his 76 sentences pass in a slow, miserable, depressing existence as a reminder of the many lives he shattered. There are two others I hold culpable in my mother's murder. Dawn Woods, the mother who knew her son's felonious criminal history and penchant for violence, yet bailed him out of jail for $1,000 after he insulted Erica Patterson by running her over with Miss Woods' Ford Escape. She continued to allow him to drive it and enabled his violence and murders that Sunday afternoon. The other is John Chisholm, the Milwaukee County District Attorney, whose misguided and ill-conceived bail reform policies led a violent, multi-convicted felon back into our community and onto our streets while already out on bail from a previous violent felony. Mr. Chisholm disregarded his duty to keep the people of this community and state safe from repeat criminal offenders and allowed a career criminal to snuff out six innocent lives. He is a coward who hides from the accountability for his office's negligence. If he had a tiny, single sliver of integrity, he would resign. Not once has Mr. Chisholm said three simple words to these victims and families. I am sorry. At least Miss Woods in her many media interviews has a humanity and understanding to say those words to the families affected. Six families have been bound together forever in grief. Six families have lost loved ones who are cherished and can never be replaced, but forever remembered with love. Six names I will now never forget. Jane, Jackson, Bill, Tammy, Lee, and Ginny. As my mom was fond of saying, may angels watch over us. And I know now there are six more watching over us. 
Judge Doral, my request is simple. Maximum terms of imprisonment, every single charge, life without parole for all six counts of intentional homicide. Thank you and all who played a role in bringing justice to the families in this community. I'm David Sorensen, Virginia Sorensen's husband of 56 years, and I'm wearing this dancing granny sweatshirt in her memory. A few thank yous, first of all. Thank you, Judge Doral. You earned your angel wings in this trial. Thank you to the jurors and those who testified who had to experience the horror of November 21st of last year all over again. Thank you, District Attorney Sue Upper, Leslie, Zach, and her excellent team. Thank you to Tom Casey, Waukesha Law Enforcement, first responders both on and off duty at the parade, medical personnel at the parade, and the area hospitals that cared for the injured. Thank you, Jan Dunn, and your caring team in the victim witness office, especially my new furry friend, Pepper, Here's a thank you that nobody knows about. Thank you to J.J. Watt. He's a professional football player for the Arizona Cardinals who gave up, gave this community um, money for funerals for the victims, six family funerals. Finally, thank you to the kind and compassionate people of Waukesha County, state of Wisconsin and others from around the country and the world who have helped the victims of the Waukesha Christmas Parade find comfort, shared in their loss and sorrow, prayed for the injured, and offered words of caring so that we may heal both physically and mentally. Although I have very specific thoughts on how I and the parade families would want revenge on the convicted for what he did, I hand over his fate now to God. So I will let God determine the revenge I ask for, be it a week, a month, a year, a lifetime. I think it's fair to say the convicted is an evil animal, and I hope that God's wrath falls upon him. It actually started before the trial did, because he took away his own God-given name. He didn't want to be known by his name. Refuse to accept him. I refuse to accept him as a person that deserves compassion or mercy. I too regret Wisconsin does not have the death penalty because if someone ever deserved it, the convicted most certainly does. Life in prison is too kind. That Bible on your table will not do you any good for where you will end up. I have struggled this past year with Jenny's Lost. It was to be her last parade. She was going to retire. <clears throat> I will continue to struggle with the loss. I am lucky to have family to care for me and wrap me in love so that I can start to glue together the shattered life I now have. I know Jenny probably saved our two granddaughters who sit behind me their lives by carrying the banner that day in their place, and I thank God for that. The life that Jenny and I built over 56 years of marriage was forever altered nearly a year ago. I will carry on in this new life with help from my family and friends. The life I was once able to share with Jenny is gone, but it has strengthened my family's closeness and in a way made us stronger for the great challenges we have ahead of us. I feel sorry she will not be able to hold a great grandchild or see all of her children, grandchildren be successful in life. But I pray to her and know she is watching over us. 
My Christian faith and church have helped me cope with my sadness and find hope and love over hate. My friends have lifted me up in their prayers. My family carries my burden with me. My dogs at home give me a small measure of comfort when I am in need. Angels will watch over all of us and give us strength. Now I want you to use your imagination a little bit. When it thunders, I imagine that Jackson is blasting a home run over the fence. When there is a rainbow, I will imagine the dancing grannies, Jenny, Tammy, Lee, and Bill, with them dancing along its lines. When there is a ray of sunshine poking through the clouds, I will imagine it is Jane smiling down on us. When it snows like it did this morning, I will imagine God's love giving us a blanket in comfort. When I see a blue light, I see this community's commitment to help heal and support each other. Judge, you have witnessed the same evil I have. You have endured a very emotional and draining that trial as I have. I ask for the full punishment within your power. I ask you to send this evil animal to life in prison with no chance for parole for the callous murder of my wife and five others and injuring 61 others. He should never have the opportunity to hurt another person and has forfeited his right to be a free man ever again by his violent actions against innocent lies, both young and old. You are a very evil, evil animal. Amen. I have one very brief statement from a young woman who was marching with the grannies and then we have I believe three statements from one more family before the next group will have to be brought in um, this is a statement from a young woman who was holding the banner with the grannies and she Mark down that the crime made her feel sad, mad, scared, and then also wrote in valuable. Asked if you were the judge, what would you do to the offender? She checked, send them to prison, and then her own idea of make the offender go through the physical and emotional pain I went through. Thank you. My name is Taylor Kulik. Standing next to me is my oldest son, Robert. I am the oldest daughter of my mother, Jane Kulik, and it is on her behalf that I will be making a statement today as she's unable to speak for herself. November 21st, 2021, the day my life was forever changed the day my mom was murdered. It's still hard to believe that my mom was killed while marching in a Christmas parade. I will never forget that day. When I received the phone call stating that my mom had been hit, I rushed to the hospital to find her. Within minutes of arriving at Waukesha Memorial, people of all ages flooded into the ER, many injured, many searching for their family members just like we were. It was complete 
chaos. After three hours spent searching and waiting, finally, a nurse came and asked us to sit down. My heart sank. I listened as they told us how my mom was unconscious when she was loaded into the ambulance, that they tried to save her, but the damage was too severe for her to fight. She was dead upon arrival. She didn't even make it to the hospital. It hit me like a ton of bricks. My mom was just murdered. She was dead. I did not sleep at all that night. All I did was cry. I sobbed for the loss of my mother. I bawled for the pain of my children losing their grandmother. And I wept for the rest of my family as we had all just lost an absolute gem. Next picture, please. <clears throat> I still cry even as we approach one year without her. This year of all the firsts without my mom has been difficult to say the least. Every holiday, birthday, and monumental life moment, each of those moments another reminder that she's not here. She was known for giving cards on every occasion and she showed up to everything she was invited to. She was always present because she genuinely cared. You could tell by the way her smile lit up the room or how contagious her laughter was. Her presence alone was just a sense of comfort, a feeling of home. She was supportive, encouraging, and just so laid back that you couldn't help but get along with her. These are just some of the reasons we all love and miss her so much. Next picture, please. Her name was Jane. Jane Kulik. Her sister called her pain, so she was anti-pain to my cousins, <laughs> and known only as grandma to my kids. But for me, her name was mom. Mom and I were super tight. I could talk to her about anything in the world. We used to text each other almost every day, talk on the phone almost at least once a week and go out to lunch just her and I every other week every day I'm missing those text messages I miss hearing her voice on the phone and receiving her adorable voicemails or seeing her face light up when I unexpectedly pop up at the house to simply say I miss my mom is a dramatic understatement of my true feelings. I'm devastated, a bit lost, and I can't fully describe how it feels other than a piece of me is missing. My smile is not so bright. I don't laugh the same anymore because I'm just not the same. I have never experienced such a painful level of sadness for so many consecutive days. I have never felt this level of heartache for myself or for my kids. Even though we talk about it, I can only imagine how my kids have felt this past year. Not only are they coping with the loss of their own grandmother, but also they've had to watch me, their mom, grieve my mom. My oldest son is dreading his upcoming birthday, just like we all did this year as it's his first in 15 years without her. My mom always said they had a special bond, and they really did. She had a unique bond with each of her grandkids, as she did with each of us. My other son, Darius, was worried that he would forget his grandma's voice. And my daughter, Kylie, is finally able to talk about her grandma without tearing up. Each of my kids had a super close relationship with their grandma, and they're all missing her deeply. We were all so close. From family game nights, barbecues, Sunday drives, to family vacations and beyond, 
We really did a lot together. We've tried to continue all these things without her, but they're different now. As the kids say, it's just not right without grandma. Some things will never be the same without her. Everywhere we go, there seems to be exactly one empty chair that she should be seated in. A perfect amount of empty space in a family photo where she should be standing or a little moment of silence where she should be laughing or adding to the conversation. Empty space. That's what it feels like. Empty, broken, shattered. Our family has an empty space where one of our members belong. An irreplaceable person was taken away from us abruptly. A member of our family unexpectedly gone. The rest of us left with a broken heart, shattered by the murder of an incredible person, left with an empty space that only she could fill. You can go to the next one, please. At this time, I would like to address my mother's murderer. Whatever your name is, I don't care. You ran over my mom like she was mere roadkill. The only reason you hit the brakes that day was to get her off the hood of your car. You targeted her, you targeted her with your vehicle and you hit her on purpose. You don't deserve to be here. You do not deserve forgiveness. You somehow still get to talk to your mom, but mine is gone forever because you killed her. It's astonishing to me that any person could have absolutely zero regard for their fellow human being. Since you call yourself a man of God, then you know that the only punishment you are deserving of is death six times over. And I can't wait for the day that I hear you're dead in prison. Thank you. I appreciate your time. My name is Alicia Kulik, and I am the youngest daughter of Jane Kulik. I've tried to figure out where to start, and there really isn't anywhere specific to start off with. I can't put all of my emotions onto however many pieces of paper, because they're just not enough. At least in my mind. I've waited for this day, both anxiously, yet ready to share my piece on the matter. I'm here, up, I'm here speaking upon behalf of my mother and the rest of my family and my twin brother standing right next to me. I've been to most of the trial that I can make it to as it is my first year in college and I, my mom would want me to put my schooling first. <sighs> I have many emotions on this subject, but without a doubt, the most ex um, the most expense, extensive emotion I feel is grief. At the time of this tragedy, I was 17 years old and I was starting my senior year of high school, which most people would think should be your best time of school. But for me, it was anything but that. I was starting my college journey, at least trying to. My mom managed to take my brother and I on at least two college tours before she had passed. It was my last prom, my 18th birthday, and of course graduating, all of which I did not enjoy. Not one of them. The joy of these things were stripped away from me. Quickly on November, tours, November 21st of 2021, I could tell you every last detail about that day, up to the clothes I was wearing. I could tell you what show I was watching, as I am thankful that I was sick that day and couldn't be at the parade to see what many got to see, unfortunately. I was bummed at first because I was sick that day and I couldn't see my mom march in her first ever parade. She was really excited. Granted, she's marched in parades before alongside my brother and I through WPRF, but this time the light was supposed to shine on just her. <laughs> 
Um, I don't even think, I don't think that it had been two hours since she left that my dad got a phone call from someone my mom had been marching with stating that she had been hit by a car. At first I thought my dad was just upset about something over work because that's kind of common. <laughs> um, or what my mind went to was that maybe the after parade traffic was pretty bad and somebody just, she collided with another car, not a car to person. I remember the first thing I did is my dad told us all to run and get our shoes and before anybody got into the car, I called my best friend <laughs> and I told her that my mom had been hit and I didn't know the extent to which how bad the situation was and I would fill her in whenever I could. <sighs> On the way to the hospital was when reality quickly set in and oh how I wish I was right. I wish that it was just this, I just wish that it was a car on car crash, not a car, not an SUV to person. As we got closer to the hospital, the drasticity of this incident was quickly revealed. Ambulances were surrounding the hospital and the waiting room was a triage. I will never forget the things I saw that day. I will never forget the chaos of parents searching for their children, demanding answers as we were for my mom. My dad rushed into the back. He had this sweatshirt on that had an ambulance symbol on it that he just thrifted and used it to his advantage. I specifically remember seeing the extreme dancers with gashes in their head and cuts all over their body and blood all over their clothes. In one direction, I saw one girl, probably no older than 10, seizing in her wheelchair, and the mother just screaming, not knowing what to do for her precious child. In the other end, I saw a girl that was on a blanket on the floor. She was screaming every time she was touched. And when we couldn't find out any information about where my mom was, I quickly knew, I quick, quickly my brain knew before my heart did the outcome. I never thanked my dad for this, but I appreciated the, optis the optimism and the composure he kept during the longest waiting period of my life. He was optimistic, saying that God would make everything okay, and we'd even joke around a little bit about my, <laughs> about my mom while she was, well, while she was dead. When a doctor finally approached us, I was in the bathroom. I had to take some time away from my family as I didn't want them to see I was upset. My older sister, she pulled me out and she told me that they finally had some information. And when they told us, when they brought us back to the room and told us to sit down, you just know, you just know. I had to prepare myself for what I was about to hear. Hearing that my mom had deathly in injuries in her head and her lungs and all the rest of her organs and she was deceased that is the words that he used he was de she was deceased that is something that i will never be able to unhear along with what i saw in the triage of that hospital waiting room that day oftentimes when i hear sirens i'm scared i'm scared that another family has to go through what i went through what my family went through and it's terrifying that in the world we live in, something like that can happen in the blink of an eye. We were driven home by a squad that car that day, considering none of us were in good condition to drive. And I'll never forget all the phone calls I had to make to tell our loved ones that my mom was dead. That she didn't get the chance. She did not get a say in the matter. I remember calling my best friend, all of my best friends, <laughs> and they stayed with me till three in the morning, and my boyfriend, they all did. And the next day, I didn't even wanna get out of bed. I couldn't. I don't, I, I still spend every day just waiting for this nightmare to end. As I think that second day, it still hasn't fully processed yet that my mom was no longer with us. <laughs> I never would wish on my worst enemy to have the burden to share such horrible news that nobody ever prepares you for. 
After all is said and done, I couldn't get out of bed for a few days, nor did I have much of an appetite. The next few days consisted of me trying to put together this new life, all of which still doesn't, still doesn't sink in sometimes. But other days, believe me, it does. Even though I've received so much love and support from the community, my friends, and my family, I've never felt so alone. I don't think I'd ever be capable of feeling this much pain in my life. But here I am. I'm watching my siblings, and my nephews and niece, and my cousins and my aunt, and all the rest of my family going through this. It's just terrible. <laughs> Up to today, I've experienced every holiday officially, besides my oldest nephew's birthday, without my mom. And they've all sucked, every last one of them. I slept through most of Thanksgiving. Christmas was probably the most depressing of all. It's supposed to be a time of cheer and joy, but how is it supposed to feel any of these things with my mom being dead? It was her favorite time of year, which made it even harder to enjoy. Every time we went to church, the song Silent Night came on, and she'd always cry. And now I do the same. I also had my 18th birthday two months after she was murdered. If it wasn't for my sister planning an amazing party for both my brother and I, I don't think I would have gotten out of bed that day. She was the woman that brought me into this world, and it didn't feel right celebrating without her. I had my senior prom without her, and she didn't get the chance to tell me how beautiful I looked, and then embarrassed me with a bunch of pictures. I had to walk the stage at my high school graduation without my number one supporter cheering me on in the crowd. I received scholarships, and my mom didn't get to tell me how proud of me she was. I spent most of my senior year in the guidance counselor's office catching up on all the missing work that I had, simply because I couldn't focus in class or at home, because I was too sad. There was a classmate in my school that truly understood what I was going through besides my friend and family. The day after the parade incident happened, she called me and she asked if I was okay because she, her family had experienced what I had. Her little sister was part of the dance team, and she was there and saw her sister get hit by this SUV. <laughs> and as bad as it seems to say, I was glad in that moment that I had somebody that could relate to my situation that wasn't family. I felt for once that I had somebody that I could bond with that truly understood the emotions that I was feeling. I'm so glad that she didn't get to experience the extent of what I did and having to lose a loved one from the moment, but she came close. <laughs> I love you guys. Quite often, I also think about my future as I think about my past memories with my mom. And although I wish I could say present memories, I don't have any. I think about how my mom won't be at my wedding and I'm gonna save a seat for her, but she won't be there and she won't get to see me say my vows or get married to the love of my life. And she won't ever get to see my future kids and they won't know what it's like to have a grandma that spoils them and how I have to be, uh, how I have to be the one with the burden to tell them of what happened to their grandmother and why they don't have one. <sighs> I won't ever get to ask my mom for parenting advice as a first time mom. You, Daryl Brooks, took these experiences away from both me and my brother, as he will be in the same position as I am. And I wish I could say that I don't carry anger in my heart, but that's just simply not true. I'm angry that all this could have been prevented if you had just stopped. <sighs> I think about how my mom saw what was coming, and she knew that there was absolutely nothing she could have done about it. 
I'm angry. Because as if my mom flying over the roof of your car wasn't good enough for you, you slammed on your brakes to get her off and continued to run her over. She wouldn't even have had a fighting chance because of you. I'm angry that all of us had to relive this trauma as you sat in that chair for weeks, not giving a single crap about any of these people. I've watched as you mocked the Bible and people's religion and the fake tears that you put on. I've watched as you gave your closing statement about asking the jury to do what they think is right when you couldn't have just done that yourself in the first place. I've waited for you to have a reason as to why you did all of this so that maybe somehow, somehow I could get the slightest bit of closure. But I never will. A lot of people have asked me how I feel about the verdict. I feel happy that he was found guilty on all counts. Well, the jury found him guilty on all counts. But you know, it doesn't do crap for me because that won't change. What happened to my mom? She will not be coming home ever again. She will not ever make me another dinner. She will not ever attend my wedding. And I'll never get to hear her voice or hug her again. So really, it changes nothing for me. <laughs> the only thing that it gives me at this time that I can say is that I know our justice system has persevered and that they have done my mom right. And I thank you all for that. As long with all the other victims. My life will never be the same because of you, Daryl Brooks. I have not enjoyed a single day fully since my mom has died. I'm depressed a lot of the time. I don't watch certain shows anymore because it reminds me of my mom. I don't do certain things because it just hurts too much. I spent most of my summer inside instead of enjoying the sun and the warmth that we only get for a short period of time here in Wisconsin. I spent it inside being sad. You don't know what it's like. I had to be in that waiting room and my oldest nephew was texting me and asking me what is wrong and where his grandma was. And I couldn't lie to him. I had to say something. I was there when we had to break the news to my nephews and my niece that their grandma was not coming home. And I saw the tears run down their young, innocent faces and broke them. My nephew Darius, he's always been into video games. <laughs> But recently, all he does is stay in his room on the video games, and he doesn't really come out much anymore, and I can't help but think that's because of this incident, that he can't see my mom smile, that she was taking from all of us way too young. My mom was the glue that kept this family together, and without her, we've been falling apart. We've been struggling to stick together because nothing's the same. And I blame you for that. Every piece of it. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you. My name is Greg Houston. This is my wife, Carrie, family members of Jane Kulik. The definition of an angel is a person of exemplary conduct or virtue. They are tasked to keep thee in all ways. Jane Kulik had many roles and relationships in her life, all of them purposeful and endearing. The impact in her many lifelong friendships were far-reaching and will forever 
be felt. Jane had spent 52 years on this earth before she was ripped away from us by you. On my daughter's birthday, which would have been a happy day, she was simply enjoying and celebrating the start of the season she loved best by handing out candy with her co-workers during the Christmas parade. That morning she went to church. She called her niece to wish her a happy birthday. Planning to call her later in the day and spend time talking and relaxing with her family before getting ready to go for a pre-parade lunch and Packer game with the last people who would see her alive. Jane considered those close to her as family. <clears throat> she had several families and roles within them. Some of them were daughter, sister, mother, wife, grandmother, aunt, and best friend. If you had gotten to know Jane, you would have known how seriously she took those roles and relationships. Her people were everything, and her biggest blessings and motivators were her children, Taylor, Jacob, and Alicia, husband John, her grandchildren, Robert, Darius, and Kylie. She was happiest when surrounded by all of them, planning trips, hearing about daily growing glows, having game night, and even just falling asleep while enjoying a movie together. The Benz Houston family was honored and blessed to spend 42 of those 52 years with Jane as our family. <coughs> there are too many memories to list that include her, memories that were both big and little life events. We would often hear stories of how her and her coworkers joked about her clumsiness, would be dressing up for the holidays, looked forward to and celebrate each other's milestones, or just plan to hang out. She was there for everything and for everyone. If she could not be there in person, she made up for it through weekly phone calls that would have you laughing yourself silly and creating a plan much like the one we had made the night before to go shopping, make cookies, just a fun holiday <coughs> celebration. She was always willing and happy to help out positive, never judgmental, spreading grace and patience to all she encountered. She loved, honored, and held dear her people and their places in her life. Our places in her life were forced to change instantly on November 21st, 2021. Our places in her life became now the people that were responsible for helping to keep her family together and keep them strong, help her children and her grandchildren make it through everything. You changed our place in her life. You made it forefront and you made us helpless because we don't feel that we could do those things the way she could have. We feel inadequate and broken because of you. The evening of November 21st, 2021, everything changed. That evening, Alicia sent me a message saying, Auntie, Mom's been hit and we don't know where she is or where they took her. We immediately drove out there to find her and helped make several phone calls to area hospitals to find her. After several hours of not having any answers, we finally decided to go sit in the lot of Waukesha Memorial where her children and husband were trying to find out information and were under a lockdown. We couldn't even go hug them. After hours of not receiving confirmation, Taylor finally sent the hardest message I have ever had to read. She's dead. She's dead. 
My daughter collapsed to the ground, and I turned to my husband and begged and cried for him to bring her back. I wanted her back. To tell you I know how we all moved and survived after that would be a lie. In the hours, days, and now a year following that night, we have all talked in the quiet hours when heartache, loneliness, nightmares, and anger set in about how much we miss her. For validation of our feelings and questioning of those same feelings, things we shouldn't have had to question. The question asked most by us is if Jane would have granted you grace. I know my answer. I know that she was the type of person that would have, never saying anything bad about anyone. But for us, it's just not that simple, sir. This is what we do know, though, as Jane's collective whole. We will and never could ever forget her. We mourn the fact that she missed her twin senior year in graduation. We mourn the loss of her presence every day and especially at family functions. We miss the long weekly phone calls on Wednesdays and Fridays, reminiscing about old times, people we miss in just our daily lives. We miss her hugs, the smell of her hair, her trying to hold in a laugh when we would make faces at an inappropriate time. And as we say, we miss the 47 faces of Jane, much of which could be seen in the pictures taken just hours before her death. We are angry she will never be the mother of the bride or have the mother-son dance at her children's weddings. We are angry she will never get to make stronger bonds with the newest members of our family or hold the grandchildren and family yet to be born to her children or even ours. We are saddened that you feel you are suffering because your life has changed. For us, it changed the night you ripped her away from us and drove by with her body on top and slowed down and ran her over. You say you have a clear conscience. How can you suffer if you have a clear conscience? At least you will always still be able to make the phone calls, write the letters and visit with your people. We simply cannot, sir. Above all else, we are angry that Jane became known by people more because of the day she died and the way she died than because of who she was. Taking all of that into consideration, we ask that you please hand down the maximum sentence for each conviction that you possibly could. The definition of an angel is a person of exemplary conduct and virtue. They are tasked with keeping their people safe keeping them cherished, and keeping them loved. Those are all the things she did. So by that definition alone, Jane was an angel on earth. Thank you. Thank you. Three, Your Honor. All right, then we'll take a 10 minute break and have you set up for the fourth. Thank you.
right, we are back on the record then, and you may continue. All right, there are a number of minors in this group, so we're going to be just a little bit more methodical about getting folks up here. So the right, first will be um, for victims AA and BB and victim AA, correct? Okay. Which does have a mic. Good afternoon. My name is Leanne Hollingsworth, the mother of two victims. I want to start by thanking everyone involved in this case by bringing justice for us as victims. I want to thank all of the officers, first responders that helped us that day, especially the amazing Waukesha County Sheriff who was willing to transport me and my daughter to the hospital so quickly. If it wasn't for you, I'm not sure she'd be here today. Thank you to all of the staff at Children's Hospital for the amazing care for my daughter. And thank you to the Waukesha community. Thank you to the Good Samaritans who stayed with my daughter until I arrived, covered her with blankets to keep her warm, tried to comfort her. To all of you, I'm forever grateful. November 21st, 2021 is a day that will forever be etched in our minds and hearts as one of the worst days of our lives. On this day, you, Daryl Brooks, made the conscious decision to drive through the Waukesha Christmas Parade and destroy the sense of security and safety of my family and thousands of others. My two daughters were doing what they love most, dancing in the parade with their teammates, when you destroyed that fun. My oldest daughter watched as her teammates went flying through the air, one of which was her sister. She had to make the frantic call to me to tell me that her sister was injured. Not only that, but because you, Daryl Brooks, continued driving and didn't stop, no one knew if the danger was gone or if they were still at risk. I remember the terrified phone call from a couple of blocks away telling me to get inside the nearest building to stay safe. As a mother, I knew in that moment I couldn't leave my kids alone, so I had to make the choice to risk my own safety, run all the way down Main Street to get to them. I myself had to see the carnage of what you, Daryl Brooks, did to so many people. Those images will never leave me and will haunt me for the rest of my life. That view can only be described as that of a war scene, one which you knowingly caused. As we made our way down Main Street, I had no idea what to expect when I found my younger daughter. Mr. Brooks, you mentioned your young daughter during the trial. I want you to picture your daughter right now, your eight-year-old daughter, and I want you to imagine the fear and anger that you'd feel if a monster drove over your daughter and many others. I want you to picture finding your own daughter when I describe what I found. <clears throat> when I finally found our group, I had to run from person to person, lying on the ground to find my daughter. And when I finally did, she was unresponsive, couldn't open her eyes, was missing her white Christmas hat and headband and her shoe, her sock was shredded with road rash on her foot. Her left leg was bent horribly in a way a leg shouldn't bend. Her head was immediately swelling in addition to the road rash across her face and the rest of her body and the blood coming from her mouth. It was over the next few days we learned of the extent of all of her injuries. Severe bleeding of the brain which required emergency surgery, severe traumatic brain injury, multiple skull fractures which required emergency surgery to repair, a severely broken femur which required two surgeries to repair, a pelvic bone fracture, and I'm sure many others that I missed in the hundreds of pages of reports from her injuries and weeks-long hospital stay. While my husband and I stayed in the hospital with our youngest daughter, unsure of whether she would live to see the next day, my family stepped up to take care of our older daughter and help her try to feel safe after the trauma that you had just inflicted. I cannot begin to expect a narcissist like you to understand what it's like to sit in the ICU staring at your daughter with tubes and wires from every part of her body trying to keep her alive, watching every monitor and test result hoping that things are going the right direction, not knowing if your daughter is going to wake up the same bright bubbly girl she was before a monster plowed through at her Christmas parade. When she did wake up, the real struggle began. Our then nine-year-old daughter had to learn to eat, talk, move, and walk again. She had to use a wheelchair and walker for months, even as she returned to school. Instead of playing in the snow with her friends at recess, she sat in a wheelchair. She couldn't dance. She couldn't run around playing with her friends. Even today, she deals with the effects of this day. Her leg still hurts. She struggles with the neurological effects of her injuries, is on seizure medication, and worries about every little symptom for fear it is something bigger related to her injuries. Your own mother and grandmother, Daryl Brooks, have claimed your supposed mental health issues are to blame, but you, Daryl Brooks, were found to be completely competent and fully aware of exactly what you were doing. All you had to do was hit the brakes instead of the gas pedal. 
Yet, like the narcissist you are, you claimed you honked the horn, but in your eyes, somehow it was their fault. They didn't get out of the way. You were so fully aware of your wrongfulness of your actions that you ran from the vehicle, tried to change your appearance, and lied in an attempt to get away from the scene. You knew exactly what you were doing. Daryl Brooks, you have destroyed our sense of safety and security in our own community. You are the reason my kids are afraid to cross the street. You are the reason my kids don't sleep at night. You are the reason we may never enjoy a parade again. You are the reason my daughters are afraid of the dark. You are the reason my daughters don't feel safe without their parents around. You are the reason we visit doctors constantly. And you are the reason their lives will never be the same again. You have taken something from them that cannot be regained. And for that, I hope you rot in hell. Walk Your Christmas Parade, November 21st, 2021, impacted me both physically and mentally because of you, Daryl Brooks. After the Christmas Parade incident that night, I had to try and find my sister. I was taken away from her to get to safety. I had to explain to my mom what happened while crying and trying to get to a safe spot. I got to finally find my family, but then getting taken away again from my mother and sister to get to safety. I had to try to stay calm in front of all of my cousins and family. I was not able to see my sister for over a week and a half, and I did not get to see my mom for several days. All of these things and many more were very hard for me. I was so worried, not just about my parents and my sister, but about all of my friends and family that were either at the parade or in it. After the parade, I was scared to go in my own house. I was even scared to be in a rumor house alone. It was very scary to do anything alone. I was scared of everything. I didn't sleep for the first night, even though you, Daryl Brooks, were arrested. I was so worried about that something might happen. I no longer felt safe. Not only did you impact me, but you also impacted my sister, Mackenzie. She was severely injured with a brain injury and a broken femur. She was in the hospital for two weeks because of you. I didn't get to spend as much time as I normally would with my parents because they were at the hospital with my sister. During the holidays and Thanksgiving, I should have been able to spend with my parents and sister, but I couldn't because of you. The inc incident impacted me physically as well. I had a huge bruise on my back as well as the bruised bones in both of my ankles. That night, as soon as you drove through the parade, all I could think about was my sister. I was so worried about her. I kept trying to find her. After running from person to person, she was the last person that I found. All I remember was seeing my teammates' terrified faces as they were on the sidewalk. As I was looking for my sister, I saw four of the girls that were injured on the ground before I even found my sister. When I found her, I was suddenly rushed into a store, as I was still on the phone with my mom. As soon as I rushed into the store, my nana and uncle both came to get me when my mom went to the hospital with my sister. All I can remember is that I wasn't even scared for myself. I was mostly worried about my family and my teammates. It was almost three hours before we were allowed to leave the church we were on lockdown. I hadn't had any connection with my family for the whole time that I was in the church. There were a lot of people coming into the church after I came in trying to all stay safe. It's hard to even think that you do not even care about anything that you did or anyone that you hurt. It's hard to know that all you care about is trying to make everyone feel unsafe and scared to do anything. <laughs> The fact that most scared me and made me feel disgust when I heard your name or saw you was the fact that you didn't stop when you hit multiple people. You didn't stop when you saw or heard yourself hitting people and the most horrific thing is that all you try to do is run away from your problems. Let this be a lesson to you, Daryl Brooks. Your crimes and stupidity is always going to come back to you, no matter how hard you try for it not to. I hope you know that you were such a horrible person that night and I hope you get what you deserve and I know that you will. Let me start off by saying I am one of four siblings that were victims of Mr. Brooks. In fact, I am the oldest child, and with being the oldest, that comes with an unhealthy ambition to protect my family. But that night, on November 21st, I felt like I was unable to achieve that goal. My siblings, fortunately, don't remember that night, but unfortunately, I do. I remember everything from celebrating my sister's birthday beforehand to meeting her unconscious at the hospital. I can't help but feel guilty for what happened to my brother that night, everything up to his open compound fracture. 
and his shadowed humerus. Something deep inside me is still believes that it's my fault. He wasn't supposed to be there that night. He wasn't supposed to be walking in the parade, but he wanted to because his older sister was there. He was right next to me through the whole parade up to when we got struck. <coughs> I can't help but feel like some of my mental and physical injuries, or some of his mental physical injuries, are my fault. I still remember screaming his name while being carried into Burlap and Lace on Main Street. I would like to say I had hope, but with all the frustrated, confused, and what-if <coughs> statements and scenarios in my head, that hope eventually turned into doubt. That night, I realized the love I had for my family. I still have regrets and struggles, but so does my mom, dad, friends, and community. We all have regrets, but the struggles we faced are laying on your hands, Mr. Brooks. My uncle always told me to show kindness through times of trial, but I am not able to give that to you. Even through school, I've been taught that forgiveness is the moral way to forget, but I will never be able to forgive and forget. I mean, how can a man not know the difference between good and evil, right and wrong, good and bad, basic things you were taught in kindergarten? Brooks, your behavior before and during this trial your ignorance and arrogance to the victims of your crime is so disrespectful and just unbelievable. Fun fact, you, Mr. Brooks, brought my mom to testify on your behalf. How could you believe that was the civil thing to do, knowing that she had four kids injured and hit by your SUV? You knew that this would affect her and my family emotionally and physically. How could you be so stupid, egotistical, and delusional? You bring up mental illness, but what I find unacceptable is the fact that you had the choice, but you kept going. I will always have the simple question of why, but that might never be answered. My sisters had a passion for dance. My brother played baseball and soccer. I am a dancer and I will always be a dancer, but because of your actions, it will never feel the same. I know my siblings and I have accepted the fact that we might never be able to regain our passions and dreams. We know that we now have lifelong challenges, but we also have people that support us and help us regain our hope and goals that we lost that night. Overall, I want people to remember that this is not about the parade, this is about the man. That depression, anger, sorrow, all these negative feelings shouldn't be directed towards the parade. Instead, direct it towards the man. This is not the parade's fault, and I think we need to come together as a community and realize that. With all the media and all the press, reaching out to my family in the past year has brought anxiety and stress. But I want that, or oh, I want to thank my family, friends, and community one more time for supporting my family through these trying times and also giving me the confidence to stand here and say I want to punch this man in the face. Your Honor, I need Daryl Brooks to serve the time he deserves without parole. I need him to be locked up for life, and that is my statement. And that was from JJ, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Daryl Brooks, I am back. Do I have to say more? My daughter pretty much clarified. <laughs> Why the hell did you bring me up to the stand? Pardon my language, Judge. <laughs> Absolutely boggles my mind. Absolutely boggles my mind. Once, twice, three, four, five times, they brought my children's names up. They addressed concerns. I just, your arrogance and your behavior is just pathetic. On that behalf though, I am here on behalf of not one, not two, not three, but four children. I'm not gonna testify and tell you all the particulars and injuries of what happened to my children. We saw that on the stand. I'm not gonna tell you about the stress of how as parents, 
we had to suffer and continue to suffer day after day taking our kids to appointments having a healthy mind and soul but you know what we're doing a darn good job I say this with a heavy heart I have my kids here I have my kids here Grayson as Charlotte says had open compound fracture we know how open compound fracture happens mr. Brooks you could have stopped you saw the darn exhibit oh, sorry. We, you saw that exhibit of my daughter you saw her and your expression is unacceptable your behavior has been unacceptable emotionally as a mother you have to go one way or another you have to let me just start off by saying as Charlotte knows there were two calls that came to me that night and I couldn't I couldn't put everything together I was just like what is going on that third call my mindset changed I couldn't cry I couldn't get mad I couldn't I had to fight for my children their father and I had to push forward do we have time to worry about our own feelings oh boy <laughs> we still are working through that I am working through that but you know what I won't show them weakness they are on a positive road mentally and physically my son Grayson loves soccer can kick that ball in any direction and now he's still learning to walk and run in a consistent manner Alice as Charlotte mentioned whose passion was dancing has sorrow now she hasn't been she hasn't made it back to dancing yet Vivian the youngest as you saw in that exhibit as I s spoke is the life of the family joking living it up when you broke her tailbone and she was unconscious at Children's Hospital for extended time you did that mr. Brooks this is on you but these kids will not be weak their family will not allow them to be weak they are gonna strive for success with what you put them through again I, I want to limit any like injury things of that nature because you know what they're striving they're doing great and I can only hope that they continue in that manner in a positive nature what I do want to thank is a few people Jeff who helped Charlotte that night um, both officer Ryan with Waukesha I'm using their first names officer Ryan who did save Grayson's life officer Ryan from Pewaukee who did drive um, Grayson to the hospital the other fellow dance families who have slowly and surely advised me of their personal connections they had with my four kids that night that I can't be thankful or sorry I can't I'm gonna be forever grateful there for their love and compassion for their grandparents who had to watch our two other children <coughs> while two of them were in Children's Hospital for extended time and for my sisters who were my heart and soul during this whole time helping my family move forward trying to figure out how we move forward with four children being injured I do have in closing as I mentioned earlier I do say with a heavy heart my hands are shaking sorry I do have a heavy heart because I do have my children with me but as Charlotte has said um, my brother who unfortunately passed away two months before this event took place always told us kindness will take you far so to those who unfortunately are not with us I just would like to read the following I watch you every day I am always very near 
I know deep down in your heart you realize that I am here. I hear you when you speak to me, when you are on your own. You cannot understand the reason, the reason that I am gone. I will never leave you. I am here to keep you strong. Talk to me. I hear you. We share an unbroken bond that will always be. Death won't keep us apart, for our love is forever. Just remember me in your heart, and one day we will be together. Live your life and live it full. Don't waste a single day. Remember, I am always with you every step of the way. And as it has been said before, we do have angels looking over us. And my children now have six more. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. I have struggled to write down words to describe the impact November 21st of 2021 has had on me. What was supposed to be a joyful day was quickly turned into an unimaginable nightmare. I woke up that morning excited for the parade instead of dreading it like I always do. Out of all the workshop parades I've walked in the past four years, this was the only one I looked forward to. If only I knew it was going to be the worst day of my life. As the parade started, I went around taking pictures of all the girls while they danced so their parents had action shots of them dancing. We rounded the corner of White Rock and finally made it onto Main Street. I remember seeing the beautiful sunset behind my girls. I recorded them dancing with the sunset behind them, little to no. That would be my last video of them. My video was taken 10 minutes before, exactly 10 minutes before the defendant senselessly drove his car straight into my girl's backs. They didn't even have the chance to move out of the way before he plowed into them and continued on his path of destruction. Alice was the first body I saw. I picked her up immediately and was quickly yelled at to put her down, not knowing it could have just caused more damage to her. She was awake and conscious. I took off my coat to give her a pillow and laid over her body to shield her. I kept telling her she was going to be okay. One thing that will stick with me forever is the fact that she looked up at me with her teeth chipped and knocked out and said, why would someone do this? I will never forget those words. The defendant was 39 at the time. She was 10. If a 10 year old knew it was wrong, so did he. But he didn't care because he kept driving. <coughs> he is the definition of a monster. After Alice, I was with two more of my girls in the street before wake, making my way to the hospital. The hospital was also another chaotic scene. Bodies all over. People were standing, sitting, and laying in the ground. I saw one of my girls laying on the floor with her mom. I held her hand and kept asking her to squeeze me so I knew she'd stay with us. She kept going in and out of consciousness. Every time she'd open her eyes, her mouth would open as she sobbed in absolute pain. I glanced to my left and saw another one of my girls at a wheelchair with about five nurses huddled around her. She wasn't doing good and they knew that. We rushed her to the back as she started to seize and vomit. When her parents arrived, I left the hospital not knowing if I'd ever see some of my girls alive again. The following days, Weeks and months were just as horrible. Four of my girls were in comas. The questions never stopped circulating in my head. Would they ever wake up? Would they even remember who I was? The thing about being a coach is you're kind of stuck in between being a mom and a friend. 
I felt trapped that I couldn't take their pain away, trapped that I couldn't be there with them at the hospital every day. I had to put a brave face on for all of my other girls, even though I was completely broken inside. Attempting to describe the impact this evil crime has had on me would be impossible. How can I write into words something that broke me so badly? Emotionally and mentally, I have never been the same since that day. Throughout the whole trial, I waited for the defendant to cry, for him to show some sort of remorse, remorse for my girls and everyone else he hurt. He has shown no sense of empathy other than for himself. Only a monster would show no remorse for such a heinous crime they committed. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he just kept driving. He knew it was wrong because he then attempted to flee after he ditched the car. He's a selfish and cowardly human being who deserves to never see the daylight again. Thank you. Thank you. you remember uh, from the trial later on that with Elizabeth and James Keaton? Yes, <coughs> My name is Dylan Urell. I'll read their symbols that I was given, I-I-J-J-K-K-L-L. But their names are Charlotte, Alice, Vivian, and Grayson. I'm not a victim. It's very hard for me to stand up here and to be talking about a victim when I don't feel like a victim. My children are the victims. Other people were victims. I'm a beholder. And I feel I'm a beholder of the darkness and the evil, but also the light and the good of the aftermath of the act of the violence that Mr. Brooks brought upon the community that evening. Let's talk about this is a Christmas parade, a Christmas parade that I have attended many times. Uh, my oldest daughter, Charlotte, has been a part of the extreme dance for many years. She was there handing out candy along with my son. At that time, I did not know that he was handing out candy but I knew that my two other daughters were a part of the teams, they were part of the junior team and the mini team. I sometimes walk into the parade. I do not like walking in the July 4th parade because it's too hot, okay? I'd rather walk during the Christmas parade when it's a little bit cooler out. But at that time, I texted my mom and said, would you like to come? I was not supposed to be at the parade. I was supposed to be up north hunting that weekend. So I decided to stay back Decisions that I reflect upon and think about how I became on that spot uh, off of Wisconsin Avenue or, uh, on that day. So my mom texted me and said, yes, I will come meet you. So I was not, and if she did not do that, I was going to text my oldest daughter, Charlotte, and say, I'm going to meet you in the staging area and I will come walk with you and hand out candy. So I was standing on Wisconsin with my mom and to say, now about this parade, now this is about children. The Christmas parade is about children, about happiness and love. That evening, if people remember, was very cold and windy, very bitter wind, where sometimes that wind gets you and you're almost just standing there. But even through that coldness and the bitter wind, you can really truly feel the happiness within the crowd of the parade. And I thought about that. And it's just about, I knew that possibly around the corner, standing over on, on Wisconsin, that eventually the extreme team would be coming around that corner and, and, I, and I'd see them. And then I had my hood up and it was, it was cold, but then at the corner of my eye and kind of watching it, I see a red SUV start to come around that corner, but not really fast, not very fast because Mr. Brooks, you hit the brakes to go around the corner if you did not hit the brakes, you would have taken that turn way too fast. And then you would have gone into the Veterans Park. So that part, it didn't seem too odd to me. My hood was kind of covering. I didn't really see the damage of the SUV. So I saw the SUV turn, but I didn't think it was odd until it did not turn and crashed through the barriers. And then the officer shot three times after it. Silence. The prey now, everyone is silent. Northwest Avenue, I live on that road, two blocks up. That is my road that I live in. Silence. But then people start kind of moving, where it's like the parade just stopped. I moved to, this, uh, moved to the corner, 
And then you start seeing and feeling the people starting to stream around the corner, screaming, crying. I have my mom with me. They're saying, do not go around that corner. There are dead people. Do not go around that corner. We both looked at each other and I said, where are the children? So me and my mom went around that corner and really went through the wake of the evil and hell that Mr. Brooks, that you brought to this community. And going through and seeing and going around the corner and seeing just bodies as far as you can see injured on the ground. And sometimes I feel personal guilt that I couldn't truly stop and help some of those people in need. I had to keep going. At time I paused and paused. I have my mom screaming, crying, seeing women, adults, people injured, deceit bodies. Once we pass through that section, that's where Mr. Brooks, you changed me. Because at that point, there's a difference where they talk about an active shooter. Not everyone saw the officer shoot. So in that case, they didn't know. There's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of just in that all the realm. People are screaming. People are crying. There's people running all over the place. That's where you changed me, Mr. Brooks. That's where I, after a thing, I gave myself up to say, if there's an active shooter, I am willing to get shot in my head. I am running up the street. Where are my kids? And that's what I did. And as the darkness descended upon that street, as the sun was going down, and I run up the middle of the street, and I run up to the five points, I start seeing the extreme truck that they use, pom-poms on the ground, but you can't see around there, around. And then I come around. I left my mom, which was a decision that I had to make. She caught up, but I took off running. I found my daughter... Alice first, and it was mentioned. She had broken teeth, blood on her face, facial. She's so brave. When I came to her, I screamed her name two to three times. There were people around her trying to help her. She looks at me and she goes, Daddy, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I didn't know what to, and she looked at me and I, I just, at that point, I didn't understand. And she goes, and I go, where's Vivian? She's over there. And I look around, and there's my youngest daughter over by the side of the curb, motionless. Her limbs weren't moving, but yet her body was shaking uncontrollably. So I went over there to help there. And from my daughter, Alice, I learned that my son, for the first time handing out candy, was in the parade. I did not know that. I was also told by her that Charlotte, my oldest, was, was there and was, she was injured. <clears throat> you did this. They weren't the only ones, the children. This, this is a Christmas parade about love and happiness, getting ready for the holiday season. I'm sitting in the other room watching other statements and watching you roll your eyes to people's powerful statements. The hurt that people have in their souls and you're rolling your eyes at them and making facial expressions. If I look around this room, no one else is wearing a mask. What are you hiding from? You're wearing a mask. I don't see anybody else. Forgiveness. I do not forgive you. I do not forgive you because I have not heard these three words from you through this entire trial. I am sorry. Not once. Not once have I ever heard anything. What I've heard you do is be abusive. Abusive to the judge, abusive to the prosecution, abusive to the witnesses. And I think that's what you have. You're an abuser. And then when people stick up to you, do you want to become? Now you're the victim. You carry your Bible and you say you're a God-fearing man. But I feel those scriptures are hollow and empty to you now. Just like God has left you. 
You can pat your chest and have that book open, but I don't believe those, those words and those scriptures mean anything to you anymore. My children are healing, and the community is he- healing. If there is no verses between me, between my children and the other people that are hurt, the people that lost their lives and their families. But we're all in this together now. Every, all of us, the community. It isn't just people that live in Waukesha. What you did have these this energy that went across, it goes so far for the people that you hurt. And I don't think you truly understand that, or maybe you don't care. For the sensing, as other people have said, I feel the maximum is appropriate in this situation. The terror, the horror, the pain, the fear that you've caused to so many individuals And everyone has their own unique path for healing. And I hope that you will get sentenced to what you deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Honestly, um, I have so much to say to you, Daryl, um, and to the court. Um, you exemplified Christ, and you were going to be very blessed and honored for that. So thank you, okay? You guys were amazing, honestly. So thank you. Um, my daughter was not listed as a victim. Um, she was dancing with Extreme Dance Team on November 21st. Um, with my niece. Um, She was on the right side of the route um, and did not get hit. Um, But she did get, she did not get hit by the car. She got hit by another team member. And that wasn't revealed to me, Daryl, until I watched the video. And I, I struggled to understand how my daughter got injured. And I'll get more into that. But that day, you impacted thousands. And I know this is just another story for you. And I wish it would impact you. And I really pray that it does, okay? So, as the parade started, we were by the library. I dropped my daughter off in her position with her team. And I just remember when the parade had stopped and I knew immediately My sister-in-law got a phone call from my niece. And my niece, who's 13 at the time, said my whole team is dead. Our girls were living in fear thinking their teammates were dead, Daryl. They thought they were dead. The images that they saw of their friends will never be erased. We got the phone call and I did not see you hit anybody. When I hit the main street, I saw the dancing grannies dying. I didn't know who they were until the names were released and I had to figure out my own head who I saw dying. One of the moms who's an ICU doctor was working on one of the dancing grannies. There was blood everywhere, Daryl. You have to see what you did. I had no idea what I was walking into. And I honestly, I'm so sorry for all the families who lost their loved ones. Um, what I saw, no human being should ever see. Everyone that was in the court witnessed what you did, but I, I lived it, I walked it. I heard things I didn't want to hear. Um, I heard someone screaming over Jane Kulik. Um, and I no longer could remember anything after that, after I saw Jean dying, till I got to my daughter. We were ushered into the bakery, and I screamed for my daughter. She was safe, but I have survivor's guilt over her living, and that's not fair. Six people died. There's a mom who doesn't have her baby boy anymore, and I got to go home with her that night. Once we were released from the bakery, we had to walk back through the nightmare. It was a crime scene. 
There were bodies covered up that my daughter had to see a dead person covered up because it was a crime scene. The next day, my daughter woke up and screaming in pain. They didn't take her to the hospital. I did what I thought was best to take her to the chiropractor and get her x-rays. That's just, I'm a naturopath, so that's what I do. Her doctor has never seen such a twisted spine, neck, pelvis. We had to put her back together. She was, but emotionally she was broken. She had nightmares. She missed school weekly. And it's because of another little girl who hit her from the car that you hit. And I figured that out a few weeks ago. I didn't know what happened. Daryl, I don't know what's in your heart. I don't. But also God tells us that we will know them by their fruit. I'm a Christian. I believe in the Bible. I believe in any everything that the Bible has to say. I'm not perfect either. But what we witnessed during the trial was you reading or holding your Bible, even in anger, saying that you were reading the book to the judge. What is hard to witness is that reading that Bible has not brought you to repentance. When I read that Bible, the things that I've done, I'm repentant and I say sorry for what I've done. I'm not perfect. So when the word of God convicts us by reading the word, it produces change. I have not seen that in you. Not once have you repented to even ask for forgiveness for what you've done. Not once have you admitted what you've done. Can you not face what you've done? You have to. You have to face what you've done. You presented to the court that you didn't want to be called by your name. This is a trial that you caused. The DA didn't cause this trial. My daughter and her team didn't cause this trial. The state of Wisconsin and all parties involved didn't cause this trial. You did. You have to own that. To me, this is not a man who's after God's heart. You used the Bible and you used God. That's blasphemy. I know what I'm talking about. This is not a mental, matter of mental health or a system failing you. You failed yourself. If you are a man like you say you are and you were not brought up this way and you were brought up in a Christian home, go back to your Christian roots. Go back to the man that God actually wanted you to be. But in turn, you have, no, you have not had any responsibility to confess of what you did that day. You can't face that you murdered people. You've injured hundreds. You emotionally traumatized thousands. And not repent from what you did. To repent means that you... And to be saved means you get to enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay? You have to ask for forgiveness. You have to admit what you did. This is not going to change bringing people back. It's not going to change the 21st. It's not going to change people's lives. But you might actually help someone heal just by saying, I'm sorry. You also said in your closing statement that this was God's will for what you did that day. And that, I believe, is a false testimony of the God that I know. You are a father. And my, my daddy, my heavenly father, would never, ever want anyone to be murdered with a car as the murder weapon. All those you hurt and killed they, that day, they're his children. Doesn't matter what age they were. <sighs> John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins, to cleanse us from unrighteousness. That includes you, Daryl. You must confess to all these people in God so that you can be saved, and that's not popular. For you to enter the kingdom of heaven, it is possible. The man hanging on the cross, like the earlier statement, he was saved that day, and the other one wasn't. And that I want you to sit with. For the wages of sin is death. That means hell. That means hell. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. So I'm angry for what you did. I'm sad that a lot of people don't get to spend another day with their loved ones. I'm sad that a lot of my dance family, we don't know. I mean, we don't know the outcome of their brain injuries and what's their future. You have to traumatize families and people that it witnessed. You have thousands. You killed six people. 
But maybe, just maybe, you could bring some peace to some of these people. Do you hear me, Daryl? Instead of rolling your eyes that what you did disrespected, and I know people yelled at you today, but I'm not coming to you in anger. I'm coming to you in unconditional love because that's what our Father offers us. I don't know if I have forgiven you yet, and I know that's what God wants me to do, but I think that you could just offer a little peace by just saying I'm sorry. Thank you. November 21st will never be the same. It was a very tragic day for us all. <laughs> With this day being the day after my birthday, <laughs> November 20th, I was thinking it would be a good day. <laughs> I was going to be dancing in the parade with Waukesha Extreme Dance Team. I loved this team as a home. <laughs> My mom, dad, aunt, and cousin were sitting at the end of the parade route. As we got closer to the parade starting, I got a really uneasy feeling in my stomach. As me being a Christian, I believed it was the Holy Spirit warning me. My cousin was also on the team with me. <laughs> in the parade, she was in front of me and we were both on the far right side. As we danced in the parade, I knew something was wrong. Something just didn't sit right with me. After this feeling, my hearing went out. All I heard was loud thump noises and my friends getting hit by the SUV. <laughs> I had seen two girls fly across the concrete and hit the curb in front of me. I got out of the way confused and in shock. I remembered I had left my phone in the car. I saw my cousin Brooklyn get her phone out and call her mom. As a 13 year old, the words she spoke on the phone are words I would never want to hear someone I cared so deeply for say. As her mom answered the phone not knowing what had happened, Brooklyn spoke and said, Mom, my whole team is dead. People then told us there was a shooting and we needed to take it to safety, so we in went inside of a bakery. They told us all to go into the back of the bakery for safety. I called my mother off of somebody's phone and told her to get inside and be safe, but she told me no, she was going to find me. I told her the building name I was in. I sat there drowning in my thoughts until my mom had got there. As she entered, I heard her screaming my name. She hugged me, and a few seconds later, somebody screamed that there was an active shooter, so we all dropped to the ground. I moved to the corner where Brooklyn, my aunt, and other friends were sitting. It felt like we were sitting there for hours when it wasn't that long. As we sat there, my best friend, my cousin, was saying something that would haunt me forever. She sat there with her head tucked in her knees, repeating over and over and over again to herself how she thought she was going to die. I thought my best friends had died that day, and this thought will forever be with me. We eventually got let out to walk back to our cars. As we were walking out, I saw one of my best friends laying on the ground of the bakery. She had not been taken to the hospital yet. I stayed calm that whole time up until I saw her. As I walked back to my car, link, link armed with my friend, we tried to look at our feet and not up at the street, but I couldn't help looking up. I'd seen bodies covered up in the streets. That image will never leave my mind. I woke up the next day not being able to move my body. I screamed and cried thinking I was paralyzed. We didn't go to the hospital, but to the chiropractor. I got x-rays done, and they came back showing the worst whiplash my chiropractor has ever seen. My spine was thrown off and twisted in ways it should not have been. It was so bad my spine could barely support holding up my head. It was the worst pain I've ever felt. My mom asked me if I had got hit in by the car, but I told her I couldn't remember. For the last year, I've been recovering still. Many days I'd feel pain unimaginable. I also had got horrible migraines a lot. Many days, my whole arm would go numb from the injury. Some days, I couldn't feel any of my left side. These days were some of the scariest. We couldn't figure out how I got injured until a video was released. It showed how a girl that had got hit flew into me, injuring me. Not only did this day change my, my, my life physically, but mentally too. I struggled with depression afterwards. I blamed myself for this awful tragedy. 
I told myself there was some way I could have stopped it from happening, even though it was something I had no control over. My mental health declined majorly. I tried my best to act okay so people wouldn't worry, but many days I just couldn't. I skipped school so many days weekly because I couldn't mentally go. I was in so much darkness, I couldn't find any light. I tried my best asking for help, but I was too scared. I thought about you every single day, Daryl. I thought, how could any man do this to any other human being? I'm sorry to all those who lost people they'll never get to see again. It angered me every day. It hurt to think about. This day will always and forever have a place in my mind. The days after we waited to find out info about my friends. <laughs> Some of them had horrible brain injuries and other horrible physical injuries. <laughs> At one moment, I was told my friend Julia would maybe not make it. <laughs> it broke me hearing that. <laughs> Knowing I cared about all these people so much, it hurt me to know they were in a situation like this. As I continued to try to heal, I realized it takes a long time to heal physically and mentally. I didn't think my mental health would ever get better. I thought this up until I surrendered my life to Jesus. I leaned on him for help. A verse that stuck with me is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. This verse reminded me that I can get through this and will get through this with the help of God. I knew if I could that my friends could as well. As I wrote this here, I finally realized this all truly happened to me. I guess I never really allowed myself to believe it because I never wanted to. But we must all face things in our lives. As I watched the trial go on, you always had your Bible, but you never repented, you never asked for forgiveness for ruining people's lives. John 16, 13 states, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak. He will declare the things unto you that are to come. And as you sat there with your Bible, all you had to do was declare what was true, to confess what you had done, when you knew you had done it and you knew it was wrong. But you sat there, you rolled your eyes, not caring that you killed innocent people. So I'm so horribly sorry to all that had lost to all people who had lost things that day. Loss of friends and family members, loss of being able to be the same person ever again. I'm sorry to all who struggle with health problems for the rest of their lives. I know that I lost a piece of myself that day, and I'm still trying to find it. This day was supposed to be a happy day filled with smiles and laughter, but it had got turned into a tragedy. This day will never be the same for any of us. Dear Judge Daro, my name is Yuretsi Becerra Montes. On November 21st, 2021, my life changed, my life and my family's life changed forever. The day that was supposed to be a day of joy that became a nightmare to me, my family, and our community. On that day, my parents and my siblings witnessed the red SUV that drove into my dance team. My mom, my mom ran without thinking she could be hurt too. She remembers the red SUV that almost hit her while, she, while running into the road because he was coming her way, but he swerved. They couldn't find me right away because I was under a car that was playing music, playing the music for us. I flew 15 to 20 feet from where I was dancing. I was lucky that I wasn't injured like my friends because my head bumped into a truck that was playing the music for us and I fell on the street and hit the back of my head on someone's leg, but I didn't suffer from a major injury. <laughs> my family calls me a miracle because things would have been worse and maybe things would look 
would look different if my injuries were more severe. I spent a couple of nights in the hospital, but the worst part was that I woke up and asked my dad what I was doing in the hospital because I was dancing and I thought my nightmare was over. It was a trauma it was a traumatic experience that traumatized all of us. While I was in the hospital, I I was remembering what really happened. I was dancing that day and I had a smile on my face. Once I hurt what I thought were fireworks. Did we're good jobs. <laughs> But at the moment, I knew that nothing happens in Waukesha and that I'm safe. And so I kept dancing. I was hurt that day. I was struck by the red SUV. I felt like I was going to die. I woke up on the ground to my family surrounding me, thinking it was all a dream, not knowing what was going on. My body was hurting and I couldn't move. I saw the looks on their faces. My mom was crying and so was the rest of my family. My mom kept telling me the paramedics to go help go help others, other people that were unconscious. My daughter is awake and is talking to us. Please go help other people, others. My mom was a hero. She helped a little girl that was hurt in the middle of the road that was being stepped on. She carried her and put her on the side of the street and asked people to help her because she was still looking for me. I remember someone holding my hand in my head, telling me it was going to be okay. Then I heard someone yell, active shooter. Scared and shocked at the disbelief of what was going on, my dad had to carry me into a bakery for our safety. All I could hear were ambulance sirens and screaming. I couldn't understand what was happening because there was so much going on. I wasn't sure if it was real life or a dream. But at the moment, I was really hoping it was a dream because I didn't want it to be real. I had to witness everything around me and my friends on the ground unconscious, not knowing what would happen to them and if they would even wake up. Since that day, I've been traumatized <laughs> with sirens, screaming, fireworks, being in big crowds, <laughs> and hearing the song I danced to when the tragedy hit. After that day, it was a very hard topic to talk about, as well as now. <laughs> to this day, I still struggle with pain and nightmares and PTSD. <laughs> I don't know when my body is going to feel normal again. <laughs> All of this made me sad, angry, and anxious because I cannot understand why someone could do this to our community. All of Waukesha has experienced this tragedy even if they weren't there to see it. As in losing loved ones, having to go through an injury, or families that were injured as well. People who watched it happen and see their loved ones get hurt, or even just seeing this tragedy on the news. This affected our community of Waukesha to the point that some people weren't and still aren't ready to go back downtown or even participate in a parade again. I'll always struggle from that day and it haunts me and so many others to think that a tradition for over 50 years has become a remembrance of the people who died and the injuries that occurred that day. I forgive him after everything he's done even though he never apologized for his actions because I'm thankful justice has been served and that he won't do damage to anyone again. I thank you, Your Honor, and everyone in the jury for making justice for all of us and our community. I ask you, Your Honor, that he won't ever see the light of day again. I thank you for everyone who supported us through difficult times. Thank you.
we do have. I would like to first address the picture that we'll be putting, we'll be putting up on the easel. In that picture, it is my sister, Jessalyn Torres, victim HH, in the ICU. It is what a lot of other victims had looked like, from tubes keeping them alive, to machines being watched over every minute of the day to see if they're doing okay. November 21st was like any other Christmas parade. My sister was dancing, my mom was pulling my baby sister in a wagon, and my brother and I were walking with them throwing candy. Everything was so normal in the beginning. Everyone was lined up in their ordered <laughs> orders and people were taking pictures, laughing, talking, dancing. The mood was very joyful and then all of a sudden it wasn't. The images and events from that day still weigh heavily on my mind. <laughs> Vivian Urell was the little girl I stayed with for a little bit after the tra tragic event. I, I still can feel the blood on my hands after I wiped it off her dripping head with my cold fingers. I told her that I was there for her so that she knows that somebody was with her as I listened to her whimpering cry that stays in my mind. <laughs> I cried when I found my baby sister without my mother. She was confused about what just happened so I held her in my arms, squeezing her as tight as I could. <laughs> I remember finding my mother and sister the vision of my mother's face in a panic trying to puzzle everything together. She had her hands over my sister's body along with others. Holding my sister's head, I screamed when I saw the sight of my sister. <laughs> her face looked destroyed with her body half naked from her clothes getting ripped off. I still remember my other family members' faces and screams when I, they saw my sister lying there. I broke down and fell to my knees. I felt broken when my grandmother started breaking down and screaming. The moment when they lifted my sister's unconscious body with a blanket into the back of a sheriff's car made me suddenly not breathe. It felt like there was no more air left in the world. It felt like I was being stabbed in the heart when I read my mother's messages about all the injuries my sister had. It was one text ever after another. I couldn't believe it was all real. From the trauma, I couldn't go back home because I knew my mom or sister wasn't gonna be there. So I went to my friends and my friend held me that night as my body shook. The pain of not being able to see my mother and hearing the cries of my two-year-old sister constantly saying that she wants her mom <laughs> broke my heart into little pieces. The whole time my sister was in the hospital, it was a blur, a tunnel vision every day, hour, minute, and second. We were lucky to have a Thanksgiving miracle to be able to see my mother for the first time after the incident. It relieved some of my pain and anxiety and it felt nice to have so much weight removed off my chest when I hugged my mother, even with it being a short visit at Children's Hospital. My family had so much support from friends, other family in the community. Even though we had so much support, I felt like I was alone. I should have been getting the support from my own mother, but she couldn't leave my sister's side at the hospital. I felt forgotten. I was trying to give my other siblings support when I thought... Oh, sorry. When I thought like I didn't have anyone to support me, I felt selfish, even though I shouldn't have. Chlorine in class every day, I didn't want to be anywhere but home, wishing that my mom and sister were with me. Not being able to physically move from the hurt that I felt, I felt drained. My mental health was declining so much. I lost interest in the people and things I loved so dearly. I was miserable. Finally, two weeks later, getting the call that my sister was awake felt like my heartbeat got back to normal again. I showed everyone pictures with pure joy on my face that my sister was awake. 
Two days before Christmas, they came back home. Everything was going okay until one night my sister felt like she suddenly couldn't breathe. My mother rushed her back up to the hospital. They found out later she had built up scar tissue in her trachea from being on the ventilator for so long and getting so immune to the drugs that she was on. She would wake up and move around in a panic. My sister has has had around 15 surgeries on her trachea since. One day, my mom was looking on the scab on the back of my sister's head, (laughs) and when I saw everything from the parade came back to my mind, the images of that day happening over and over and over again, it brought back all the pain and anxiety. (laughs) I laid in bed alone, crying because I couldn't sleep. I was back to the beginning where I would cry all night. The images were so vivid in my mind. My mom called me upstairs and held me in her arms. The next day, my uncle explained what PTSD was like. As the air gets thicker and my chest feels like it's getting smaller, I realize that this is just the beginning of a long and terrible road. I easily jump at little things. I have panic attacks every time I cross the street. I hate fireworks for the reason that they make me cry. (laughs) Still to this day, the sound of tires screeching sends me into a panic as I look for my siblings. The pictures come racing back to my mind, tears come racing down my face, and as I see is everyone is okay except for me. The pain is still sitting with me, the visions are always there to jump back at different times. It's been hard to to be the oldest sibling, having to feel like I need to manage the house and deal with my own mental strain while my mother is constantly gone dealing with my sister's medical care. That one incident turned my life upside down and life has just hasn't been the same since. Most importantly, I just want to thank everyone who was there for my family and supported us unconditionally at the time my family was needed most. And for you, Darrell Brooks. I hope you know I've never had so much hate for someone until I met you. Everyone saying that they wish Wisconsin had the death penalty for you? I simply disagree because you do not deserve a simple death. Those six people who passed did not have a simple death. I hope you sit and suffer every minute of your day. Thank you. I'm Jocelyn Torres, victim, HH, in life after November 21st, 2021, will never be the same. I was dancing with the walk show extreme dance team, I, team, a team I loved and committed countless hours to. Two weeks after the parade, I woke up in the hospital, confused, uncomfortable, and in pain. I remember doctors telling my mom that I needed to have a major surgery to fix my pelvis that was broken in three places. So I'd be able to walk again and dance again. I was nervous scared and I just wanted to be with my family again. After my surgery, my doctor told me that I had to be in a wheelchair until my pelvis was healed. When I got in my wheelchair, I felt stuck, trapped in a place that I just wanted to get out of. When I got to see my sisters and brother for the first time ever since the parade, I could just see the weight lifted off their shoulders when they saw me. I was not okay, but I was there. When I finally got home after a month of being in the hospital, it was nonstop appointments and physical therapy. Two days after I got discharged from the hospital, I had to go back for an emergency surgery because I couldn't breathe. We found out that being on the ventilator caused scar tissue to build around my trachea. I've had over 15 surgeries on my trachea since then. 
My mom had to help me with all my personal care and other needs, including showering, getting dressed, using the bathroom, doing my hair, and making my food until I learned how to get around easier. I had to go to physical therapy to learn how to walk again. When I started using a walker, I felt embarrassed and that people were just staring at me. I remember wanting to dance again, being with my team again, but knowing that I couldn't physically dance. I had to reteach my body to move how it used to move. Learning how to dance all over again. My balance was off, making dancing impossible at first. But the mental pain was worse, as I couldn't watch my teammates dance without me. I missed over half of the school year. When I got back to school, I felt uncomfortable being in a wheelchair. I felt like people were just looking and wondering. I missed out on my last year and days at elementary school. Time and memories that I will never get back. This past summer, I had to go in for my second major surgery. The surgery was on my trachea called a trachea resection. The doctors decided to do the surgery because I still couldn't breathe after all my procedures. My throat wouldn't stay open and it closed up to 80%. I was basically breathing through the size of a drinking straw. Now I have a scar across my neck that stands out and won't ever go away. And a scar where I had surgery to fix my pelvis and multiple other scars from the hero her horrific things that happened that night. My scars make me insecure of my body and that I can't wear regular swimsuits because I can feel people's eyes on me. When I wear shorts, I have limbs speaking out and my scars, my scars will be there forever. So I will every day be reminded of what happened to me. Beyond my original month in the hospital, I missed out on my entire summer because I was recovering from surgeries. <clears throat> when I went back, when I went home, I wasn't able to do normal 11-year-old things. I wasn't able to swim, jump, go on rides at fairs. All I could do was watch, watch people have fun during their summer, watch people play during their summer. While I continued to watch, <coughs> I had to act like it didn't bother me because I didn't want to ruin summer for everyone else. Now I am 12 years old in sixth grade. I'm happy that I'm at a new school with new people. Now people won't treat me differently because they don't know my medical past. Now that I'm in sixth grade, I have to ride the bus. I hate going to the bus stop because it scares me whenever cars drive by me or make noises. I'm also dancing again. I do two three hour practices each week. And this past weekend I had my first dance competition which was a big deal to me because this is my first competition in a year now. I still have appointments and procedures on my trachea to see how everything is healing. I also got cleared from physical therapy. I've gotten really far this year. It is getting closer and closer to November 21st and I don't think I'm ready for this day to come. On this day each year I and many others will think how a peaceful event that has been a tradition in Waukesha for over 50 years and brought smiles and laughter to everyone turned into tragedy. I want to say thank you to my coach Alyssa for proving to me that I can do anything I put my mind to. Thank you to Ms. Hansen for helping me write my statement when I didn't know how to put everything into words. Thank you to all the doctors and nurses who took care of me in the hospital. And most important, thank you to my mom who was by my side for the whole tra tragic journey. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Amber, mother of Jocelyn Torres. 
I've been very open all this time about the injuries my daughter has obtained the night of November 21st, 2021. <coughs> I even created daily logs so people could stay informed on her condition. But I've never truly talked about my feelings and how that day has affected my family. So this will be a very hard one for me. Let me put picture one. The event started off joyous and I had four of my children with me that evening, all of which still suffer in some form to this day. The screams, the sounds of the people being hit, watching as their bodies flew, the visions of their bodies lying everywhere, and me yelling, searching for Jessalyn, still replays over and over in my head. I found my daughter lying in front of the music truck, nowhere near the rest of her teammates, in the middle of the five points with her clothes ripped from her body road rash everywhere, blood leaking out of the corner of her mouth and half of her face missing. Picture two. My poor child was ripped out of her shoes, drug under the front end and thrown out from that vehicle. There was no ambulance, no medical equipment, nothing to help me and my child. I have never felt this helpless in my life. All I could do was hold my child and tell her mommy was here and that she will be okay. Picture three. A deputy and an officer came to help get my daughter on top of the blankets that were covering her naked body and drove us to the hospital in the back of an SUV. I am grateful for the actions they took that day, along with all the others who ran out into the street to help my daughter. When we got to Children's Hospital, I sat there in a chair numb as I watched multiple doctors, nurses, and medical staff rush in and out of the room examining my child's lifeless body. My mental state was confused. I lost who I was, and I felt like I was sitting in the middle of some crazy movie scene where there was so much commotion around you, but you hear none of it. I stayed numb from then on. It was my coping mechanism. There was no way to prepare myself for the news I was about to hear from the medical staff. Her injuries included a fractured skull, a hematoma behind her eye, eight broken ribs, which was four on each side bilateral lung contusions, three fractured lumbar vertebrae. Her bowel was damaged, her kidney was ripped from its blood supply and was dying. She now only has one kidney left. Her liver was lacerated, her pelvis broken in three areas, going from front to back and down the middle in the shape of a T, and in two areas on the back side. Her spine has a permanent curve in it, severe road rash all over her body, pictures four or five. Go to five, please. That's her backside from being drugged. Go to the next one, please. That's the other side of her backside from being drugged. Next one, please. That's her leg. A whole chunk of meat was missing from her leg. You can take those down, please. She was given multiple bags of blood and platelets as we were transferred to the fourth floor ICU for critical care. It was there that the doctor sat me down and explained how she needed to be intubated because of the extensive damage to her lungs and body. The hardest moment of my life was making the phone call to my children. The hardest moment of my life was making the phone call to my other children so they could tell their sister how much they loved her because I had no idea what was to come next. They were so confused and scared and I could hear the hurt and pain in their voices. And I had no explanation to give them other than just tell your sister how much you love her. I couldn't be there to hold them while they cried in a time that they needed me the most. I still hold so much guilt because I couldn't be there with them since I had to be with their sister whose life was uncertain at the time. They were also mentally and emotionally traumatized. There were so many times I just wanted to hold Jessalyn or lay in the bed next to her, but I couldn't since there were tubes coming from every direction and her head, hands were tied down to the bed. The most I could do was hold her hand, stroke her head and whisper in her ear, I love you and mommy is here. I believe it was day two when we spent three to four hours just to thoroughly clean out all of the road rash and it took multiple attempts to get as much of the leaves, sticks and rocks out of her hair. There were so many sleepless nights. Every day there were new issues, high fevers, allergic reactions, sepsis, 
and monitors that were blaring and alarming because her stats were up and down constantly. I felt like I just could not catch a break. She was not easy to keep sedated, and there were so many wrestling matches to keep her as still as possible. It was all so exhausting, but yet I had to hold it all together. I had to be the rock. I hated watching the machine they used to help clear out her lungs. It was similar to a nebulizer, but had a force so strong, and it was so loud. It would pump the meds in and jostle her whole body. Just hearing how loud the machine was and watching her body being uncontrollably shaken was overwhelming, but it had to be done to clear all the fluid and mucus buildup from all the damage that you caused to her lungs. The time we were trying to wean her off the ventilator, I sat and watched the machine hoping this girl would start to breathe on her own and not rely on the machine to do it for her. It took days and many trials. I would get my hopes up and then they would be let down. I would talk to her. Come on, Jessa, you have to breathe above the machine. You can do it and I believe in you. Until finally I realized she wasn't ready. I just let her know it was okay and I'm here by your side and when you are ready, I will still be here right next to you by your side. I had so many mixed emotions the day Jessalyn was extubated. I couldn't wait to hear her voice again, to hug her and to tell her how much I missed her. It felt like my girl was being reborn again, but I was not expecting the new hardships to come. She has had a total of 18 surgeries. Her first major surgery was to fix her pelvis. 12 hours my child was gone away from me that day. She now has a metal plate with 11 screws holding her pelvis together for the rest of her life. Picture eight, please. It took months for her to start to walk again. I never imagined that at 11 years old, we would be celebrating the first time she sat up or stood and of all things, take out a tube feeding. You can go to picture nine. How does that look for sitting up? Does she look happy? I don't think so. Winning off the narcotics and dealing with the hallucinations she had was terrible. She was so mean at times and it hurt more than you could imagine on this inside, but I knew that that wasn't my child. Deep down, I was so angry, frustrated, and wanted to scream. So I'd just step out of the room and cry a little, take a deep breath, and walk back into that room stronger than I was before. You can take that down. Discharge day was so exciting and scary. I could finally see my two-year-old, my other children, and be comfortable in my home. But managing all of Jessalyn's medical appointments, medications, daily shots, and personal needs on top of caring for four other children was difficult. Her dignity was taken away as I had to do everything for her for personal cares. And want, what 11-year-old wants her mom to wash their bottom? She would get frustrated trying to use both the wheelchair and a walker, and half the time she would forcefully shake that walker around and toss it off to the side. And having to load and unload her wheelchair, walker, and medical equipment took about 30 minutes in the freezing cold. The first day I had to take Jessa and my two-year-old out was rough. When backing out of the driveway, I ran over her walker and broke it. I laugh now, but yep, I forgot to put it in the car. I sat there in disbelief, laughing and crying all at the same time. I was a mental wreck. <laughs> we ended up back at Children's Hospital a couple of days after discharge when Jocelyn was struggling to breathe. Found out she was suffering from tracheal stenosis from the initial prolonged intubation. Can you do picture 10? That was the hole she was trying to breathe through. About the size of a straw, a little bit smaller. 80% of her trachea was closed off. You can go to picture 11. That's the size they had to pop it open to, just so that way she could actually breathe. You can turn that off, please. I slept on my couch for months because her breathing was so bad that I was scared she would stop breathing in her sleep. 15 surgeries on her trachea before we made the decision to do a tracheal resection. I hated the thought of doing this major surgery, the thought of possibly opening her chest to lift the chest muscles to give more stretch to the trachea, or the possibility of injuring her vocal cords along with all the other risks 
they were also very overwhelming. We only get one breathing tube, and if this major surgery wasn't successful, then she would end up with a hole and a tube in her neck for the rest of her life to breathe from. Justin and I both cried together after that doctor left the room. How do you mentally prepare yourself or even your child for this type of news? Tell her, telling her that she would be asleep and intubated for another two weeks and in the ICU and then eventually go home once we did the whole removing the tube, feeding, sitting, standing, walking, and everything all over again. We were all going back to square one. She was so calm that day when she left the room for her surgery, but I knew she was freaking out on the inside. She held herself together so well. And I remember her looking at me saying, Mom, why are you crying as I let the silent tears roll down my face? That surgery took six and a half hours. I stared out windows and paced for hours, hoping for the best outcome. On day two after that surgery, a lobe of her lung collapsed. She was running fevers and she was retaining too much fluid. We continued for days with her vitals going sky high then dangerously low, fevers up to 104 and she became septic all over again. It was day four through the night when everything become be, became beyond scary. Her body swelled in a matter of hours and scans became, came back showing that she had pneumatosis intestinalis and necrotizing enterocolitis. And she was almost rushed down for an emergency bowel resection as this had become life-threatening extremely fast. There was no real understanding as to why this was happening other than that the, her intestines were not fully healed from the parade incident. Her body was shutting down. Nine days she spent on the ventilator. A total of 12 in the ICU and more on the main floor. It was another full two weeks stay <coughs> at Children's Hospital. Two weeks of mental and emotional upset and two weeks away from my other children. And if you are sitting here thinking that being taken off the ventilator is all pretty rainbows and butterflies, you're wrong. It's nothing like what you see on TV. Traumatizing, isn't it? It is traumatizing. It's okay though. You're doing great, right? Yeah. Get you some oxygen. I can't. You can't. No, you just breathe. No. Just breathe. She struggled to breathe and cough up all that mucus for hours. Hours. Her mental state was off as she thrashed around and freaked out as the nurses were adjusting her bed, screaming, Mom, help, help me, Mom, they're going to shock me back to life. She thought that she was dying and that they were going to kill her. I knew that she had some worries before that surgery, but to this extent was beyond belief. We had to give her meds to calm her as her thrashing around was our biggest fear as that could tear her trachea all over again. Even on all those drugs, isn't it funny how she can still express how traumatizing this has all been? The summer went on with more appointments, physical therapy, surgeries, activity restrictions, winning off of narcotics that made her so mean to the point that I had to step away and do that silent cry again. We tried to find a little happiness in every event that we could. It was hard for her to watch her teammates who were all back dancing. She cried because she wanted to go watch the state competition, but couldn't since she had to be in another surgery. We felt left out and alone as we were still dealing with major medical issues months later when out in the public, people would gawk, make hand gestures, <coughs> and make comments about the scars across her neck. Number 13. <clears throat> Along with the marks and lumps on her body. Kids are cruel and have made some really harsh comments to the point I have felt the surge of uncontrollable anger. She was tired that day. <laughs> <sighs> At 
fairs and festivals, Jessalyn wasn't able to ride rides because of the possibility of tearing her trachea. You can take it down. She was so sad and angry, more angry than sad. Her friends and family were having a blast while she was standing watching. My heart hurt for her. I had to talk her through the anger over and over and over and teach her how to find happiness in everything we do, no matter how big or how small. But she was right. It wasn't fair. She shouldn't have had to suffer. Not one person should have had to. My heart was broken the day she purposely stood out in the sun because she wanted the scars off of her face. You can pull it. You can post it. My heart was broken the day she purposely stand out in the sun because she wanted the scars off of her face and wanted her beautiful brown skin back. I guess it made sense to her that tanning would help. While riding in the car, she, would, she will freak out when there is a squirrel on the road. A squirrel. Okay? A squirrel. She gasps, yells, and throws her arms out and hits me. While I'm calming her, I sit there and envision how I'm sure that that's the exact reaction she had right before she took your SUV to her chest. This is all just a small fraction of what we have been, what we've all been through and what I've had to push through in the last year. You can take it down. Jocelyn still has ongoing medical care, more surgeries, more appointments, memory loss, pain in her hip, and permanent curve in her spine. I hate the comments she makes about whenever she feels her hardware in her hip. But my girl is a warrior. She is back dancing. She may not be at the skill level she used to be, but she has not given up. As a parent, I have held so much guilt for not protecting my child that day. I have sat there by my child when she was at her worst. I was there for every little step of progress, and I was there for every setback. I have cried. I have been angry. I have had to deal with fear, mental trauma, PTSD, exhaustion, frustration, defeat, loneliness, and anxiety attacks. There are days when I feel that SUV hitting my chest and can't breathe as if I am my daughter. I could feel her pain, and it was excruciating. There have been times where I felt justice wouldn't be served until he had to take that SUV to his chest, drug, thrown, and left with his bare body in the middle of the street exactly the same way he treated my child. This man has brought out such an ugly side of me I never knew existed. It's not your life on the line, Mr. Brooks, and it never has been. It was my child's life on the line that night, along with many others. And as much as you were hoping to get some sympathy, I have none to give. I'm glad I don't have to hear those words come from your mouth anymore. I guess you should have thought about all those children of yours that you don't get to hold before you decide to turn that corner and step on that gas pedal. And I hope the look on my daughter's face before you ran her over haunts you for the rest of your life. Your immature behavior of rolling your eyes and twirling your fingers doesn't bother me. I have fought through one of my biggest fears this past year, and I won. I am much stronger than you. I have found my peace. This man may have been able to turn my life upside down and almost take my daughter from me, take time away from my other children, create such heartache, pain, and mental turmoil, but the one thing he was not successful at was taking my strength, Jocelyn's strength, along with the strength I have instilled in all my other children. He doesn't get the satisfaction of thinking we have become weak. My family has grown stronger, have become closer, and now have a better appreciation for the time we have together. He did not, cannot, and will not break me. Thank you. Thank you. The day November 21st came around, I was excited to dance with all my best friends. Little did I know, that was the worst day of my life. That day changed my life forever. My family and my friends thought that that was the last day they would have with me. I can't even imagine what everyone was going through while I was unstable in a coma with a brain injury that later led to me having to get part of my skull taken out and put back in two months after. 
this major change in my life was all from the car that had struck me and many others on November 21st, 2021. I became worried and stressed because people treated me differently and I saw myself as no longer strong, but weak. I didn't like that I could have a seizure. I lost my hair and it made me feel bad about myself. This made a huge impact on my life. It changed the way my friends and family all see me now. I hated myself and I hated what I had to go through. It was hell. I just want all the awful days in the hospital, trauma, all procedures to be put behind me so I can continue to live my life like all the days before the worst. November 21st, 2021. However, since I am a victim of the Christmas parade, this will always stay with me. Thank you. Good afternoon. As I stand here before you today, I realize that you don't know who I am. I have been here almost every single day since this trial started. I realize that I am what, what I am about to share will not change what happened that day, but I hope it will give me some sort of peace and help me continue to heal. The Waukesha Christmas Parade was an event that both of my daughters have been involved in for many years with their dance team. This year on the day of the parade, it was very cold and windy, so instead of walking alongside the dancers, I decided to take on a new role. I volunteered, volunteered to sit in the bed of the pickup truck that was leading our dance team. I was filling all the parent volunteer buckets with candy. I had the best view of my daughter the entire time. She was in the front row, dancing her heart out and doing what she loved most. In one split second, all of that happiness ended. Through the parade route at an incredibly high speed, I saw your pickup truck approaching the girls. At that moment, no level of screaming could be heard because of the music playing in the background. The dancers did not see you coming, but I did. It was horrifying. These girls that I have become so close with, flying through the air, losing their shoes, their hats, and their gloves. A sight I will never be able to forget. This is a vision that will haunt me for the rest of my life. I jumped out of the pickup truck so fast, not knowing where my daughter's body had landed. Once I was able to locate her body, I took one look at her and I thought she was dead. She was not moving. She had blood coming from her head, her ears, her nose, her arms and legs, she was not awake or responding. I was unable to keep my composure. With my shaking hands and through my tears, I somehow managed to call my husband. He had stayed home with our youngest daughter, who was homesick. If she had not been ill that day, she would have been, she would have been dancing alongside her sister. I tried to explain to my husband what had happened, but honestly, I don't remember much after that. Meanwhile, a man, who I believe was a spectator at the parade, came to my aid as I was trying to explain to my husband over the phone what had happened. This good Samaritan also had to keep me away from my daughter, who was lying lifelessly on the ground. As her mother, all I wanted to do was pick her up and hold her. However, I was unable to because she needed medical attention. All of the injured girls from our team were being triaged right there in the middle of the street. I remember screaming out loud, asking what was taking so long for an ambulance to arrive. In hindsight, I realized it was only minutes, but during that moment, it felt like eternity. Everything just seemed to be moving in slow motion. Samantha was taken to Waukesha Memorial in the first ambulance that was able to get to us. She was later transferred to Children's Hospital because doctors realized that was the best place for her to be at the time. And due to the overwhelming amount of injuries from your reckless and thoughtless behavior, Waukesha Memorial needed more space for other hurt individuals. The other people that you carelessly hit. Thankfully, I was able to ride in the ambulance both time with my daughter, hoping and praying she would survive. Once at Children's Hospital, Samantha was taken for a second set of scans to evaluate what needed to be done. We quickly learned that she needed immediate surgery where they would do a craniotomy to relieve the pressure from her brain swelling. 
When she came back from her emergency surgery, I lost it. She was intubated in a medically induced coma and her head was wrapped in gauze. I just wanted to talk to her, her to talk to me so badly. I wanted to hear her voice and know that she was okay. At that moment, I would have done anything to switch places with her and take her pain away. Mr. Brooks, how could you possibly do this to someone? I need you to listen to me as I list her injuries. Acute respiratory failure, bradycardia, a skull fracture, multiple skull fractures, five fractures in different areas of her, of her face, including the mastoid bone behind her ear, the bones that hold her eye into place, a fractured cheekbone, a brain bleed, an intracranial hemorrhage. Did you hear? The doctors told us that they did not know what the outcome of her injuries would be. They would not give us any false hope. They told us they did not know if she would survive. My husband and I did not know what the rest of her life would look like. If she survived, would she be able to walk? Would she be able to talk? We had no idea what the future would hold for Samantha. Our daughter was in a coma for two weeks in the critical intensive care unit at Children's Hospital. They needed to make sure that her brain was healing properly. Those were the hardest two weeks of my life. My husband and I lived at Children's Hospital, never leaving her side. We spent every, every hour of every day watching her body temperatures, her brain pressures, and the clock. We spent Thanksgiving at Children's Hospital trying to find as much time to spend with our youngest daughter who was not allowed to see her sister because of COVID restrictions. Weeks later, once medical uh, personnel believed it was safe, she was slowly taken off her sedation meds. That was when her battle took a turn. Samantha is a fighter and she, would, she was not about to let you destroy her life. Samantha had to learn how to swallow food we spent weeks learning how to talk and walk again. Because of you, Samantha suffered a traumatic brain injury. She was unable to live a 14-year-old teenager's life. We struggle not knowing if or when she will have another seizure. Because of you, my daughter had her most beautiful hair shaved off. After spending 22 days in Children's Hospital, she was finally discharged. Finally being home with both my children was far better than Christmas morning. Even though it's almost been a year since this tragedy, it's still so painful to see her struggling with some everyday life experiences. I consider Samantha a gift. Based on the injuries she sustained from being hit by your vehicle, she should have died that day. But she didn't, and for that, I am so grateful. My heart goes out to those families who were not as fortunate. Since the first day you appeared in this courtroom, you have, been, you have done nothing but make a mockery of this trial. I sat here every day listening to you act like this was just a game and showing no remorse for what you did. I have no forgiveness in my heart for you. You said as a father, it hurt because you could not hold your babies, but yet you run over my child like she didn't mean anything. What kind of father does that? Because of you, our lives have been changed forever. Whatever pain you may encounter in prison will only be a fraction of what Samantha endured after this tragedy. Judge. We ask that you give Mr. Brooks the maximum sentence for each count without the chance of parole. Thank you. Thank you for being here.
one more statement. Um, <clears throat> hi. Um, oh, I left my pictures in the hallway. Can you grab my pictures? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, one, one at a time. There's just two. Okay, sorry. I'm nervous. I forgot that I'm in the hallway. Um, this is our daughter, Olivia. <coughs> She is the baby of our family. Um, that photo was taken on November 21st, 2021. At that time, she was an innocent eight-year-old who was excited to get to perform in the, the parade with her best friend and her teammates. And it was something she looked forward to every year. Um, my mother-in-law and myself and I also um, join her every year and hand out candy and it's something that's become um, I guess a tradition that um, was taken away from us by by Daryl Brooks because of his selfless <clears throat> just a, a ability to, to have please don't do that it's so disrespectful I've watched all day on TV and I've watched you mock all of the victims all day you roll your eyes and you make faces. If this was your eight-year-old daughter that someone else hit, you would have been beside yourself if someone made those faces. And you want people to have forgiveness for you and your child? You're insane. I hope that, that the judge puts the most amount of, of years on your sentence and I hope that you live in hell for the rest of your life for what you have done to all of these victims. Do you realize after you hit me and my mother-in-law, I spent five minutes walking around looking for my daughter on the ground. I was looking for her through little girls that were keeled up in little fetal positions because you had ran them over. You hit them with 3,300 pounds, and you don't care. Right before you hit me, I turned around and I looked at you. I didn't see your car. I saw the look in your eye. You knew exactly what you were doing. You knew exactly what you wanted to do, and that was because you are a narcissistic piece of shit that thinks you can get away with everything. And you are not going to ever get away with anything ever again. You did what you wanted to do, which was instill fear and horror in all of these children that are involved. You're a child killer. A woman killer. I cannot wait until somebody inflicts that harm on you. I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's Olivia. And the next one is my daughter in the hospital room where I sat next to her for five days where she didn't move. My daughter who was in the ICU for five days and in and, and, and children's for an additional nine more in the critical care unit because of her brain injuries that you caused to her that she still deals with daily. I was late because I couldn't leave her because she didn't want me to leave because of her separation anxiety that you caused.
You should not be allowed to be a father to your children. I'm so glad that you are being kept from them. The shit you would teach them would make them as, as evil and miserable as a person that you are. daughter victim gg or maybe i mixed up the designation but that's Does FF anyone else want to make a statement i believe that was gg your daughter is FF. okay thank you i believe that that concludes the statements your honor all right thank you attorney operates 456 do you want to make your statements yet tonight Whatever the court wishes, Your Honor, I probably have about 15 minutes worth of comments, but... How many? About 15, I would say. Um, I'd like to have you conclude tonight. Okay. I just want to take just a short break sure. um, before we do that. Um, I think we all could use probably a short comfort break and a stretch break, and then we'll be back in about 5-10 minutes uh, you. to hear your remarks. <clears throat>
back on the record then an attorney upper um, you may provide the court with your sentencing recommendation thank you judge um, obviously uh, I'm very grateful to the court for its patience and listening um, to all of these victims here today it was very very important that you hear from them directly and uh, the stories that they shared with you um, really very personal and very compelling as to the impact that this crime had on so many people on so many levels the the focus of my comments your honor will briefly uh, speak as to Daryl Brooks and his prior history because I think it's important there's a record of that um, but I don't intend to spend a lot of time on Daryl Brooks because I think what's already been said is the most important message that I'd like this court uh, to think about overnight as you consider your options here. I will tell the court as to Mr. Brooks' uh, prior record, the court is aware from the bail jumping charges he's pending on several felony counts in Milwaukee County. Uh, 21 CF 5020, he's charged with intimidation of a victim, that being Erica Patterson, and felony bail jumping with an offense date of November 8, 2021. He's pending on case number 21 CF 4596 with an offense date of November 2 of 2021, charged there with resisting, obstructing, felony bail jumping, second degree recklessly endangering safety, domestic battery, and domestic DC. That is the case where he is alleged to have struck Erica Patterson in the face with a closed fist after an argument. And then as she was walking away, intentionally ran her over with the same 2010 Ford Escape that he used in this attack. <coughs> When the police went to his mother's home and found him there, he uh, was in the Ford as they approached. He got out and tried to run into the house. He ignored their commands to stop. He tried to flee and uh, eventually was apprehended. He lied to them and said he was not driving the Ford SUV that day, even though there was evidence to the contrary. That case is pending in Milwaukee County. He was released on $1,000 cash bail in that case on November 19th of 2021. There's a third file pending, 20 CF 2550. The charges are two counts of second degree recklessly, I'm sorry, reckless use of a weapon, felon in possession of a firearm. The date of violation is July 24, 2020. He was released on cash bail in that case in March of 21. In that case, the allegation is that he got into a fight with his nephew. And as his nephew was leaving the area, the defendant fired one shot from a handgun toward the vehicle that his nephew was in. The vehicle was occupied by one other person and therefore he was charged with two counts. The next day he was taken into custody and a loaded Beretta 9mm handgun was located just a few feet away from him. That handgun had previously been reported stolen. I believe he has court on those files later this week in Milwaukee County, Your Honor. As far as convictions are concerned, there's a 2012 conviction from May, May 15th, 2012 resisting obstructing misdemeanor in Milwaukee County, sentenced to 30 day, 37 days jail consecutive to any other sentence. 423 of 2012, there were two files disposed of in Milwaukee County. One of them charged uh, misdemeanor bail jumping and possession of marijuana. He was sentenced to 180 days in the House of Correction on both counts concurrent. There was another file for felony possession of THC as a second or subsequent offense. He was also sentenced to 180 days in the House of Correction for that file. I'm sorry, what was the conviction for? A felony possession of THC as a second or subsequent <coughs> offense. Thank you. 
On April 30, 2010, he was convicted in Wood County of strangulation slash suffocation with other charges for battery and criminal damage to property dismissed and read in. There was a withheld sentence for three years probation. Ultimately, it was revoked in 2011 and he was sentenced to serve 11 months jail. 2009 conviction from Manitowoc County for misdemeanor obstructing, sentenced to two days jail, time served. 2005 conviction from Langlade County, actually it was a, a county ticket for disorderly conduct. He never paid the fine on that, so he ultimately served 30 days jail. 2003 conviction in Milwaukee County for resisting obstructing, 20 days in the House of Correction. 2002 conviction, Milwaukee County felony possession of THC, second or subsequent offense, 50 days in the House of Correction. 2000 convicted of substantial battery, party to a crime, sentenced to prison, withheld and three years probation imposed along with six months of condition time. That probation was ultimately revoked and he was sentenced to prison. That's his record from the state of Wisconsin. He has a record from the state of Nevada. June of 2016, he was charged with a sex offender registry violation, failed to appear in court on that offense and there is currently an outstanding warrant for his arrest active in the state of Nevada. 2007, he pled guilty to statutory sexual seduction as a felony. A suspended sentence was ordered for 36 months probation. That's what led to the uh, sex offender requirement, uh, registry requirement, which he is currently non-compliant with. <coughs> In December of 2006, there were two files disposed of in Nevada. Uh, one was a domestic battery as a misdemeanor. He received a suspended sentence. And the other, he was found guilty at trial of obstructing misdemeanor and sentenced to jail. In the state of Georgia, he has a conviction from May of 2021. I'm sorry. Not a, not a conviction, an arrest from May of 2021 for misdemeanor battery, domestic violence. The disposition of that case is unknown. And uh, of course there's a paternity action that was pending here in Waukesha County that uh, had been uh, a warrant or capius had been issued for him on at least eight occasions during the life of that file. That's a 2003 case. He was sentenced to jail on several occasions for failing to pay child support. He uh, was once allowed Huber privileges on a jail sentence, but had the, those Huber privileges revoked in 2009. Most recently, there was a warrant issued in August of 2021, and uh, Judge Maxwell signed an order to lift a stay of a 120-day jail sentence. That is the extent of his criminal history that we are aware of, Your Honor. Um, I think it's very plain on its face. He's a lifelong criminal. He is someone who has repeatedly, continuously uh, disobeyed law enforcement based on the resisting, obstructing uh, type charges. There's multiple counts of bail jumping, disregarding court orders, disrespecting court orders. There's multiple acts of violence. There's weapons violations. This man has a history and a pattern of engaging in violent, dangerous behavior in the community. And it was no different on November 21 of 2021. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the attack. And I choose to call it an attack instead of referring to it as the parade, as somebody mentioned. There's nothing wrong with the parade. The parade is good. The parade is the embodiment of a community. 
That's what you expect to see at a parade is children at a parade, families, people from all over the area coming together for a joyful, happy event. The parade will continue. It will kick off again in a few short weeks. And I hope and pray there's joy and laughter and kids in the street collecting candy. That's what it should be. So I'm not gonna to refer to this case as the parade. I'm going to refer to it as what it was, an attack. And the facts are very clear, Your Honor. Very few of the victims who were struck had any idea this car was barreling down on them. It's an act of a coward, plain and simple. They had no way to know it was coming. And he mowed over them and ran them over without any ability to defend themselves. What is so offensive about this conduct, Your Honor, is obviously the violent nature of it, but even more so, the defendant's conduct and behavior in this court, his complete lack of uh, regard for the decorum of the court, the respect of the court. And, and I don't mean you personally, of course you deserve that as well, but I mean for the sanctity of the court, the courtroom, the process that we as Americans respect and treasure and protect for well over 200 years and he can't engage in the most civil behavior as being quiet when another person speaks. Many, many people came into this courtroom over the course of the trial and the proceedings. Every one of them was able to sit and obey the court's order. If you ask them to stand up, they'd stand up. If you ask them to sit down, they'd sit down. If you told them court's in session, be quiet, they all would. Everyone was able to do that except Daryl Brooks. I think he was able to do it. I just don't think he wanted to. I just think this is all part of his charade. This referring to himself in the third person, trying to distract him or, or detract himself, I should say, from the events, taking absolutely no responsibility. It's the act of a narcissistic coward. Those words have been used here today and nothing could be further from the truth. He is a coward. He ran like a scared little chicken from this parade, trying to slither away in the dark of night, but only to stop long enough and try and take advantage of good citizens that would help him. He calls and lies to his mom, right? Get me an Uber. I can't get into it. He lies to the officers repeatedly we saw the time of his arrest. We heard the testimony from Daniel Ryder, a good man with good intentions and a good heart who took this murderer into his home and held him there long enough for the police to come and take him away without any knowledge whatsoever of what had gone on. He takes advantage of everyone. He's extremely manipulative. He absolutely thinks he's in control of everything when in fact, as he sits here in custody, he's in control of nothing except for his own behavior. Mr. Brooks, be quiet. Except I'm, I'm for not his... going to sit here and be disrespected. Mr. Brooks, be quiet. I'm not going to sit here and be disrespected. These are sentencing arguments and they can make them. So I could do the same thing? Mr. Brooks. There's nothing disrespectful. They are doing it in yes, a respectful way. Yes, it is. Okay, way. copy out of my name again. Judge, the, these are the facts. You heard from so many of these parents and so many of the people that were there of that fight or flight, right, that kicked in. He ran. He fled. He tried to protect his own self. That's it. That's all he did. Everybody else sprang into action, whether that action was to immediately account for their behavior, for their family and get them out of there to safety, whether it was good Samaritans and judge, I 
really thought long and hard. I had a video clip that I was perhaps going to show to you. Um, you've seen a lot of this during the trial, but I mean, it comes from the clip when I showed during my closing argument near the end of the parade route where the Catholic community had been struck and all the shoes laying in the road and things like that. That person that took that video walked down Main Street for quite some time and captured quite a few images and it's really quite powerful, but I also thought it's really quite painful. But one of the things that was just so remarkable to us as we watched things like that was the average citizens that just sprung into action to save somebody else. There was a particular moment where there's a person uh, on the ground fervently performing CPR on a victim in amongst a pool of blood without any regard for themselves whatsoever. I don't know who this person was. I don't think I'll ever know. But it's a prime example of the good that came out. So many people talk this afternoon about good versus evil, and I definitely believe that's what this case was about. Daryl Brooks is the epitome of evil. He is yeah, evil in the person. Room, please. No, we may not. The community is now good. Order the people court, are so I good. Can, I think it would be the best for me to just go are good. The Mr. Court. Brooks, I'm talking. I don't care about you talking. I don't care what you care about. I know you don't. Sit down and be you, quiet. No. Nah, Everybody has told you nah, that. No, 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 no. See, you got, you got it all wrong, Miss Opper. Judge, the community has spoken. This jury returned a verdict in two hours. That's how open and shut this case was. Well, actually it was okay. Everybody saw it. Actually it was Everybody okay. but Daryl Brooks. Mm -hmm. This you jury know, deserves you you know. to be commended for their conduct, their God patience, you know. their service. You know. Mr. Brooks? I asked to go to the other court. I'm not so sending you there. So we wouldn't have to go. It's not, that is not a place you get to request to go to. It's so when you disrupt to, the proceedings. She's I'm not almost trying to done. Disrupt the proceedings. I'm trying to go to the other courtroom no. so she can finish saying the I BS wanted, she got to say. I wanted to share something with you, Judge. This is something that came in on December 5th, of 2021. An anonymous letter came. Well, it's not anonymous, it's signed, but it's from a person we don't know from another state from the state of Kansas, December 5 of 2021, this person took time out of her day to write a card to, it's addressed to the Waukesha community and it was sent to our office. And she wrote, we have been praying for the healing of your community. Please know that there are people who care deeply all over this nation. That's the kind of message Daryl Brooks needs to hear because I know during the trial, uh, there was a lot of cards, a lot of messages received in my office and in your office. Good, hardworking, decent people that respect the law, that respect human life, that respect their neighbors, that would take the time to comment and say, good job. We support you. We are with you. And you saw that strength behind me all day. Those young kids, children coming up. I mean, Your Honor, I'll say this. God is good. There's been a lot of talk about God. There's been a lot of talk about religion. Daryl Brooks brought the Bible into this courtroom. These children are remarkable for their strength, for their healing, their physical healing. We haven't met these kids before. We've never met them. We met them today for the first time. You would never know the serious injuries that they suffered as a result of Daryl Brooks by looking at them. Of course, there's much healing to be done. But isn't it remarkable that in a year's time, look how far we have come as a community. Look how far these families have come. These families, these victims that stood up and pointed to Daryl Brooks and said, you will not beat me. You will not knock me down. That's what we need to move forward with as a community, Your Honor. His behavior is done. We're done with him. He has forfeited his right to be in this courtroom. He's forfeited his right to be in our community, period. There is not one thing that mitigates this sentence, not one. 
He deserves the absolute maximum sentence on all counts consecutive. Look, Judge, you saw the videos. This wasn't him plowing in to one large group of 50 people at one point in time and hitting them. It was linear. He hit one, kept going. Hit two, kept going. Hit three, kept going. All the way down the street. That's consecutive sentences, Your Honor. That's intentional, willful, volitional conduct that warrants consecutive sentences stacked one on top of the other just as he stacked victims up as he drove down the road in complete disregard for any other person whatsoever. We kept the kids out of the courtroom in the trial, Judge, but boy, it's impactful to, to listen to them today and realize this isn't just, you know, victim GG. This is a child that you willfully ran over with a 3,000 pound vehicle as so many people so uh, adeptly observed. Police officers, first responders, the medical professionals. It's kind of weird, Judge, because we're coming up on the anniversary, of course, and we're coming up on the weekend before Thanksgiving, which is a weekend that a lot of people pay attention to on the calendar because here in good old Wisconsin, it's deer hunting season. It's a lot of uh, families going out, starting their Christmas activities, uh, Christmas festivities, Christmas shopping, whatever it is. So it's kind of that kind of a weekend that comes around every year that on its own, it's not a holiday. It's not really a known day, but we all know that first weekend before Thanksgiving and what it brings uh, we all look forward to maybe a short work week, spending time with family, getting together, and here it comes, and it's the anniversary of this attack at the hands of Daryl Brooks, but Actually, we're going to have an ability to move on from that. We have the ability, we have the tools as a community, Your Honor, to do that, and that's definitely because of everyone everyone that responded to this incident, the first responders, the police officers, the medical personnel that got paged in on a Sunday night when we're all hunkered down, Packers had played, it's cold, it's dark, and they all had to spring into action and, and respond. And there were law enforcement from all over Southeastern Wisconsin, fire department, EMTs, no one paused, no one hesitated for a second. They just came and helped. And I think that's something that our families, our community can build on as well, Your Honor, to say evil is easily overcome here. Daryl Brooks deserved to be locked up for the rest of his life. He cannot be trusted ever, ever again. I ask you to consider, uh, I'm not gonna go into it, but uh, we had filed the other acts evidence some of the language in that other act's evidence, the intimidation of the victim. It played out repeatedly in this courtroom. He tried to intimidate you, he tried to intimidate me, he tried to intimidate the witnesses. He tries and tries and tries, but he fails. He's not the strongest person in the courtroom, he's the weakest person in the courtroom. Morally bankrupt, that's what he is. His character is void. I, I asked Attorney Basie, what's the word I can use for low character? And then we came up with the fact he really has no character. It's one of the factors the court needs to consider. Protection of the public, the severity of the crime, they all weigh heavily in a stacked sentence, Your Honor, consecutive maximum across the board. Every one of these victims deserves that. I don't know how we look at any of these victims and say, well, he got concurrent time on your case because your pain and suffering wasn't quite as bad as the guy before you or the girl before you. They all deserve that sentence that speaks to their count. The restitution, Your Honor, I filed the paperwork. We are seeking restitution in the dollar amounts uh, uh, from my letter that we reviewed this morning. Um, I'm asking under 973.20, sub 11, sub F, that you enter an order that the Department of Corrections shall uh, keep 50% of any wages Mr. Brooks may earn in prison. 
and any uh, monies that may be paid on his books or canteen account and direct those monies to be paid directly towards restitution. He should not uh, be able to work or receive canteen without paying down that restitution. Um, I also included in my letter the request uh, that should any monies ever be paid by contract to Mr. Brooks, that he should attempt to benefit financially from these crimes, that those monies would be placed into an escrow account maintained by the Department of Justice and um, paid towards the restitution. The restitution in this case is ridiculously low when you consider it. And that's, again, because of the generosity of good people all over the world that contributed to a community fund and uh, other individuals who generously donated to help these families pay for funerals and medical expenses and things like that. Can you imagine when you're, you heard these mothers describing what their children have been through? Can you imagine the medical bills on these? And he's lucky he's getting off with a $200,000 bill for restitution, Your Honor. I think he should have to pay every last penny of it. I also wanted to wrap up again, Your Honor, by saying you didn't hear from all the victims. Certainly um, there were some that just cannot bring themselves to this court in any fashion, in any way. And um, we ask you to keep them in mind as well. Um, especially the Bill Hospital family. Um, Bill was, you know, walking in support of his wife's uh, team and trying to be in a supportive role as he had done on many other uh, occasions and lost his life for that simple action, that simple act of good that he participated in. Um, there were some groups that um, are not represented here today, but I know you heard their story at trial and you're um, aware of what some of them went through that maybe um, wasn't specifically addressed here today, but I just ask you to keep in mind that uh, we certainly prevented, presented a wide array of victims to you, but not everyone. And then certainly, as I mentioned at the outset, the community as a whole, uh, absolutely demands justice for for the, these victims, these families, and for the community itself, that Daryl Brooks has no redeeming value, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Brooks, as far as I can tell from the correspondence from your mom and from you, I believe there may be closer to three individuals plus yourself who wish to speak at sentencing. Um, since we lost an hour or so today, although we did go late, so and arguably we gained it back, I still was thinking about starting at noon just to make sure there's ample time. Um, I will start uh, the Zoom shortly before that. Um, the information has been provided to your mother, and I believe she will provide it to the other individuals on your list who wish to attend and make a statement on your behalf. So right at noon, we will start that process. Typically, um, I would hear from the individuals on your behalf with you going last, but you tell me if you want it to go a different order. Uh, that's, that's fine. All right, and then I'll hear from you. I may take a short break before I come back out, um, or even a longer break, depending on the timing of everything tomorrow. Uh, to just collect all of the final statements uh, and process them. Obviously, I'll take the overnight to process what I've heard today, uh, in addition to what I've already been doing on my own. Um, and I haven't seen any written statements on your behalf. Um, I don't know if anything came in today during this hearing, uh, but uh, I'll rely on the verbal statements that are made and then yours at the time of sentencing or prior to me imposing sentencing, okay? I apologize. I'm, it's, it's very emotional and frustrating right now, so I apologize to you, Your Honor, and the court. I understand it's, it's frustrating, and I understand that. It's just very hard to sit and, you know, 
it's almost like a pylon. So I, I still understand that I have to conduct myself uh, respectfully, so I, I apologize. I think the apology needs to be made to the victim, sir, more so than this court. Definitely. I was just referring to I know. the... All right, anything else from either party before we conclude for this evening from the state? No, Judge, we'll see you at noon, thank you. From you, sir? Not at this time. All right, we are in recess. I'll see everyone tomorrow at noon. Thank you.